Hey guys, we're live again. Um, I feel like this green screen is making my camera look really bad, but um, we're going to stick with it for now. So anyway, uh, thanks for coming on. We have a real treat for you today. So uh, the only issue you're going to have today is this is going to be just a tangent fest. So Carl and I are off, off to the races already. So um, Carl has been involved. We'll get into what he's been involved in. Uh, when we bring him in. So, cause there's just too much. There's just too much. The episode will be an hour by the time I get his intro done. Um, but I'm so glad that everybody came in. Uh, well, so far everybody's come in. We've had it pretty much the same amount of exposure as we had last episode. So hopefully we'll get up to 20 people in here today. Um, let's see, we've got a lot of projects we're working on, so we'll see that. I don't really have a treat to share today. I just have from the box. I don't know what this is, but we'll see. Eddie Sin. We'll see what that's about. It kind of looks like a pecan pie. I don't know. We'll eat that later. Um, it, it already looks better than a pickled sausage. So these lights aren't doing me any favors again today, are they? Let's try that. All right. So um, guys, without further ado, let me bring my new friend Carl on. And he's going to show us we got some extra video to watch. We've got some great stuff to do. Um, and, yeah, I see all of our folks. Mantis God's going to be lurking in the background. Well, stick around, guys, because there's definitely video. Carl, thanks for coming down to us today. Hey, dude, how are you doing, man? I'm doing good. So, hey, thanks uh, for inviting me on. Well, thanks for first for being a Patreon. Um, to have someone that you guys will know in a minute what Carl's all about, but to have someone that's as into actual science as Carl, as Carl is, uh, and to have him support me on Patreon and to do what I do um, is unbelievable to me. So that part alone is unbelievable to me. So and it, it helps me to validate and keep going with this kind of a show. Um, so I appreciate it. So thank you very much, Carl. Hey, and like I, I mean, I think when I was writing to you, I said, hey, you know, I got a choice. I can support regular people or I can give it to a billionaire like Bill Gates for his foundation. <laughs> it's like, who needs it more? We need a groundswell of people like you coming up and right. doing, we need doing, what guys. Yeah, doing what you're doing, collaborating with each other, getting together and moving. Yeah. We try Rather to than paying the big wigs. I mean, I'm, I work in the wild. I'm not going to pay somebody in a suit and tie. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. So, guys, Carl is one of the most interesting people I've ever met, for real. Um, and I've met some people. But, yeah, t more tangent-based than, than Chris Biggs. Um, more, <laughs> pretty much as knowledgeable as Russ or Clint, I would say. Um, and we're just going to have a good time today. So, did you want to show the video first to kind of explain? We're going to talk about the work you've done specifically in Mandal Bay today i know there's a lot more that we could talk about in future episodes but i'm fascinated so carl is one of the linchpins if not the linchpin that saved this amazing pristine bay on the virgin islands uh saint thomas is that right yes yeah, saint thomas virgin islands we're a territory state. of the united states of america well hopefully you'll be a state soon uh well, someday Probably not. We can but. be we, we, we can vote on that if we want. We can be independent, we can become a state, we can become freely associated, a whole bunch of weird things that nobody understands. So we'll just yeah, remain as we are for now. Sounds good. Sounds like you're doing okay. Yeah. Um, but Mandal Bay was gonna be pretty much wiped out for some development for a resort, essentially. Um, and a water reclamation. Yeah. Um it was a large scale resort. Um, um Talking three hundred and change, change um, units plus condominium, timeshare, multi-level shopping center, um, sewage treatment plant, um, and they wanted to make it all inclusive and then link this to an island that was just offshore. And basically, um, it was also going to be cut off from the area residents and just the rich people could come and zip back and forth in a little jolly fun, just destroy a little lagoon and then put up. They had a nice pretty painting as to how it would look afterwards with buildings and stuff in place. Yeah, I bet. I bet they had some great designs. Um, and, and I love that, like, they wouldn't even let the islanders in except to be, like, bartenders or something. So, yeah, they, they said there would, there would be a section where we of the beach where we could frolic, often often a little corner, you know, keep us away from the real people. 
60 square feet. Yeah. yeah, but we do have a public beach law in the Virgin Islands where nobody can own a beach. Okay. 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 It That's gets good. tested. I bet. So, I bet. okay, you wanted me to show you some. Well, I'm just going to grab a clip from in the middle of we had a PV, um, public broadcasting system at the time um, aired. Um, the okay. beach together it was about 15 minutes. I'm just going to grab a, uh, about two, three minutes from in the middle. Okay. Yeah, people get a feel of what the area looks like and is. Yeah, I want these guys to see, besides the, the thumbnail that I did, um, what this area looks like. It's amazing. It's amazing. Okay, guys. and then there's still shots, and we got a little we got a little present for your viewers a little later on, too. Okay, all right. Yeah, remember, I gave you some links. <laughs> you did. Anyways. You did. Okay, so uh, um, here it is. Um, you did what you needed to do to turn on the audio, right? So I'm going to click over. Um, I did. Yeah. If you click it, I'll bring it in. And okay. then it may just so bring it in automatically. Share screen. Share screen. And that screen. Share it's system audio. Share. I have to look around my camera to see. Here we go. Okay. So here we go. For real. Here we go. Yeah. Miles did some research here. Maybe I put it in the. Uh, the intro, but uh, or in the description, but yeah, it's mangrove is a big oh, part of crash. this bay. You see what it's doing? I don't see any. Oh, I see it. It's spinning. Yeah, I see your cursor <laughs> kind of spinning. It's cursing at me. Welcome to ISO Buddies, the the land of technical difficulties. Here we go. I think. There, oh, it's a bigger one. Wrong one. Whoa, that's the wrong one. No. I mean, it's beautiful. Yeah, so I love that you put the video together Day at Mandal Bay. with these lovely girls walking on the beach. <laughs> got eagle rays. Mandal Bay Beach and Lagoon is a rich and diverse ecosystem, teeming with life on land, in the air, and beneath the waters. to dozens of rare, endangered, and protected species. It provides both recreation and sustenance to residents and visitors. I think that by the end of this video, you will agree that Mandal Bay is too precious a resource to be exploited by commercial development. Together, we can save Mandal Bay for the future and most especially for our greener planet Earth. My name is Marissa Martini and I'm here at beautiful Mandal Bay, St. Thomas, Virgin Islands. When we look at the big picture of Mandal Bay, we begin to understand the difficulty of comprehending this complex world of wildlife. It is a constant melting pot of organisms, some migratory, some staying for a while, and others settling in to make a home where none other exists. Each day, life pours out of Mandal Bay into the bordering Atlantic Ocean. It feeds sports fish like marlin, human foods like tuna and mahi-mahi, and also protected species like the island's dolphins. It is integral to the oldest of Earth's creatures, as well as the largest inhabitants of our planet. The United States Fish and Wildlife Service has declared that the U.S. Caribbean island of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands contain the highest biodiversity of life in the United States of America. Nowhere is this more true than at Mandal Bay. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service also states that the high biodiversity makes the area ideal for environmental restoration projects and education. That is just so great. All right, okay. we'll pull that in later if you need to. So yeah. now that was most of those yeah. underwater shots were by you, right? Um, all of them. All of them. Yeah. Um, 
I do have shots with a lot of the land life because I know your people are more uh, a lot interested in the bugs and whatnot. Uh. And the smaller critter crawlers. And I do have a, a, a sea dwelling isopod for you that attaches to the local fish. Um, maybe I have the, the parasitic guys. That, that <laughs> um, not parasitic. Okay. Um, more like a guy who didn't pay for his Uber. <laughs> A hitchhiker, a hitchhiker. I got you. Yeah, um, the it seems that there's no. They just like hanging around. You find them inside the mouths of fish and various things. You see. Um. Yeah, we're getting slow down. Hello. We breaking up. Hello? Is my internet gone crazy? Oh. Hey, um, yeah, they, everything went off for a while. Are we back? Yeah, I think you were fine, but um, yeah, I get kicked out. Let me turn okay, off. Okay, everything was background. frozen on my end. Okay, I think we, we definitely have this, so uh, they can see and hear you still. So you get okay. to keep going. Oh, well, if I could. All right, let back. me I'll, let me show you our little friend. Um, if I can share screen again for a moment. Okay. You see, I'm also not used to using Chrome. Okay. Yeah, guys, I think so, my issue has been this virtual background. It even looks yeah, that uses now. a lot of mem that uses a lot of memory. It's looking a lot better now, so I think that's the problem that I was having. So if I can figure out a better way to do it, we'll just have to put DJ Space Cat back behind me again. Okay, I have a screen available to show. Perfect. Um, that's... Oh, look and at him! him. Yeah, and actually, just called Isopod. <laughs> In, um, the the fish the, yeah, the little fish identification things and everything else just calls it isopod. Okay, and yeah, they find them tiny. So when you catch a fish, you'll find some, them sometimes, the little tiny ones inside the gums and whatnot. They get okay. big. You'll find them on just about um, any any reef fish. Um, but this is a squirrel fish, which they seem to like to ride on the most. And um, the, the little folders that I made for you and for your people. I'll start putting some little videos of underwater isopods doing weird things. Beautiful. So, okay, because, yeah, they'll attach on and eat lobsters, um, all sorts of other, other types of stuff. Okay, so now back to Mandal Bay. There were things you wanted to know because I can also show pictures of this region, too. Yeah, you can keep cycling with your pictures as we go, and we can stop um, to check out a picture here and there, but um, yeah, and so for the channel and for the page or whatever, the Facebook page, we are ISO buddies, so everything kind of adjacent, which they're kind of a lynchstone speak or uh, lynchstone that's not right. Um, but they're kind lynch of pin? a uh, lynchpin, I and a cornerstone, a lynchpin, cornerstone, a lynchstone species. Let's make up a new <laughs> word today. Um, <laughs> but they're kind of involved in everything on the planet, so. Um, okay, so you've got this, a hive. Yeah. So yeah, when I started animals. this, it was all the uh, everything attached to it. I didn't want to just be another isopod channel because there's plenty of those. Keystone. That could be it. Keystone species. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna keystone use keystone species. From now on. Okay. Now I wanted to show you something on the shared screen. I'm gonna I'm putting an yeah. image up here. Okay. Um, you see that, right? That's Yankee Stadium. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now you remember there was a comment in in my thing saying that um, the um, U.S. Caribbean islands are the most biodiverse region in the United States of America. Yes. Okay. Um, more than twenty thousand identified species in just this little area. Okay, right. which basically trumps Texas and California, who battle between each other for the most biodiverse state. Okay. Okay. So there's Yankee Stadium. All right. Now. I'm going to take you over to, let me click open Mandal Bay, which was just here, and I keep losing stuff. 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> so now, here's Mandar Bay. All right. And as you can see now, you like to verify. I'm going to go. They're the same scale. Okay. That so Yankee Stadium, Yankee Stadium below. You see it, it? Yeah. Down here in the corner. So Mandar Bay, Yankee Stadium. All right. And then I have one where I decided to go ahead and overlay them for you. Unbelievable. <clears throat> okay. So now, if you can follow, if you can see my mouse, the area that I'm tracking with the mouse yeah. uh -huh. is the area of the APC. Okay. okay. Sorry. Dog in here and around. So that's your protect. That's the area that's got, we call an area of particular concern. And that has also been designated by the legislature as an area for preservation and restoration. Okay. okay. This, despite all of this, the governor signed the lease with the developer group. Going to this place. So, okay. as you can see now, the life form that you just saw in that little three minute portion of the 15 right. minute clip, and um, all right, um, fit in that area, which is basically about what one, two, three, four times the size of um, Yankee Stadium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, now the other thing about this region is um, it's not just a rare habitat on St. Thomas but it is a rare habitat worldwide, which at a glance, you might not say, huh, what about that? It looks like a beach with a lagoon. Yeah. But it's one of the few places in the world where three species of mangroves live together. We have okay. the black, we have the black, the white, and the red. And these are species that help protect coastlines from erosion and those type of things. This was, these were going to be disrupted as well. So, I mean, when we saw this last hurricane, Irma Maria, we had two category five hurricanes that were like um, nine days apart in 2017. Wow. Yeah, um, we had up to 220 miles per hour, totally destroyed the solar plant, everything. <laughs> okay, but when that came by, Okay, we saw massive shoreline erosion across the entire island. The only areas that did not see that were areas that were cushioned by the mangroves. And since then, now um, we've also engaged in a program with the university where um, this is one of the last mangrove stands left, and we are now harvesting the pastures. Um, okay, these the, these little green buds that drop down from from the um, red mangroves. Those are the ones that stand on stilts. The mango trees that stand on stilts. Right, right. Yeah. And so right now we're collecting those and we are rebuild we are manually growing them and rebuilding mango forests on the island right now. It's at an experimental stage where the university has several groups out and we're a home deeper bucket, salt water, and drop a couple of them in there. And <laughs> yeah. Okay. See, that's all it takes for science, you guys. Okay, yeah. When they start to germinate, you just throw a little sand in and it's sitting on um, about five years. You can transplant them outdoors. They get to about three feet high. I do have pictures of them. I didn't line them up here for you of, of um, the mango trees and buckets. But yeah, um, it was thought to be difficult. Um, but germinating them and getting them to that strip and getting them to a size that we can transplant turns out to be relatively easy. The test is when we get them into the environment. It's like right now, I, I used to be part of a coral reef restoration effort around the island. Right. Okay. And we're you know, talking about, okay, we're making these little hangers and we're seeding more coral all over the place because the waters are getting warming and we're seeing bleaching and we're having coral loss. And then I started thinking, wait a minute. Okay. This is like, all right. So my hands are dirty. I need to eat. I'm going to wash my hands with dirty water so that now I can eat. It's the same. Yes. Yes. That's exactly we're, what you're doing. We're, we're, the coral are dying in that water. Without fixing or treating whatever it is that's fixing them, we keep adding more. So we're just okay. adding, yeah. And my concern with that is there's, there's one feeling where you can say, okay, they're going to develop a resilience. But there's also another feeling that you're introducing um, immune deficient species into the wild and populating them more. And we just saw what can happen with that with COVID. 
Yeah, yeah. And exactly. in actuality, there was something like that that occurred among um, the Elkhorn coral. Elkhorn that's the one that is. Coral. That's the one you have that's critically endangered, right? It only really is there in the bay. Yeah. Um, right now, the um, transplant efforts have been successful with that in many places, but um, at the height of when these things were being wiped out worldwide, 95% of those are gone worldwide. Um, they flourished in this way. They never, for some reason or another, they were never impacted by whatever was impacting them in the rest of the ocean. And the last theory that I heard was that there is a certain, there is a certain level of human sewage that saturates the entire world's ocean and that that gave them an infection similar to an E. coli. That was the last I heard. Don't quote me on it. That's what I heard that came out of our research lab in Florida. But I mean, okay. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how the world can't handle that and they got whales pooping. Have you ever been under a whale? Yeah, but we don't have that many whales left. So um we do get we do get them into Mandal Bay. Um the area here has about what um twenty to twenty to twenty-three different um cetacean species that come here between um dolphins oh, wow. and whales. <clears throat> um the largest regular whale that comes here is the humpback whale. Okay. Um, yeah, which is that which, that's the whale that does all the singing and whatnot. Um, yeah, they don't eat no waters. The only reason they come here is to give birth. Wow, okay, so yeah, um, a huge percentage of the humpback whales that you see out there are Virgin Islanders, and practically all of them are West Indians. And then they head back up to the north and eat the food up there. So we thank them for leaving our fish alone, <laughs> right? But um, they do get hunted and harassed by the local killer whales, which only once have I had a report of a killer whale being in Mandal Bay, but on the south side of the island, um, in the in more of the Caribbean area going towards St. Croix, that's more their habitat. And no, it is not a factor of global warming. Killer whales have always been in all oceans all over the world, all oceans and, sea and seas, every each land. So there was somebody who saw one and he had punch and power. And this is a warning regarding, we, we want to talk about citizen science. This is a warning about the, the, how easy it is to go off on the wrong track. Okay, he had some punch and pull and everything else and had got, actually got a TV network to run with the, run with the fact that, hey, the, the polar ice claps are melting so much that there are no killer whales in the Caribbean. Okay. The fact is, you always see the TV shows with them in the Arctic. They're easier to find up there, shallower waters, colder waters. That, that's their hunting season and everything else. Right. But right. Um, the um, most of these male whales are migratory creatures in the past through here and hang around here for a while and then head back up. So we do have a whale watch season, and I've conducted several of the whale watch tours for um, one of our co-organizations, um, the Environmental Association of St. Thomas and St. John. We call it EAST. Okay. 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 So um, they assisted in this Mandal Bay thing too. Um, one of the key things with being a citizen scientist, know when to get help, know when to reach out to others, have your networks. Okay. Both your amateur networks, your semi pro networks, and your science networks, and your business networks. And then never ever forget the federal government, though they are pain in the butt, mostly because of the paperwork. <laughs> Okay, but the thing of it is, if you develop these um, relationships at all levels, you're not going to get stopped in, in what you need to do. Um, at Mandal Bay, I was telling you before, okay, you said you, you, you did the homework on me, did the background checks, looked up online, did the deep search and everything else. I had okay. to do I had to do some homework because, Carl, you came out of nowhere, and uh, you guys have no idea, but in talking to Carl to get this going, um, every time I talked to Carl, he had one more insanely amazing story for me and it they were i'm not gonna lie carl they were so amazing it was like suspicious i'm like who is this guy and so i had to i did like three days worth of research just on you and uh pretty much i mean i didn't verify your family stories but everything you said about yourself is 100 percent true uh if you if you google carl callwood guys um you're gonna come up with all kinds of connections to this Mandal Bay and environmentalist work. 
um, when I saw Carl show up on Patreon, his, I didn't even know you were a viewer for the first part. Um, and then, but your email was, uh, I don't know exactly, but it was like citizen scientist at, at conservation.org. At clim climate change VI. Citizen scientist climate at change. climate change VI .org. Yeah. So I was yeah. like, just this email was interesting to me. I was like, wait a minute. I want to talk about citizen science with this guy whose email is just citizen science. And then the stories just started to come in. Um, and they, I'm telling you guys, they were amazing. So we're going to definitely talk to Carl again. Um, not that we're ending this episode or anything, but we're definitely going to talk to Carl again in the future. Cause I couldn't, I could do a whole channel of just you and have videos for a year. So it reminded me, I forgot to pull, I forgot to pull out the um, EPA award. Ah, that's yeah, fine. Right. It's yeah. fine. Next we'll time. Some other, yeah. Next, Next time. time. It, it, yeah, it's on the shelf somewhere. I, I've never I've never hung a plaque on a wall. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, that would um, be one to do. Yeah, I guess so. But I don't even have any pictures on the wall. Well, I mean, this is my dive rack behind me. That's a spare rack. My other, What I use today is outside drying. <laughs> How so, many hours yeah. do you think you have? How many hours dive do you have? Um. I can tell you the exact number. One second. Oh wow! Okay. It's twenty-eight thousand nine hundred and thirteen. <laughs> I wish Victor was here. Victor would do that's, the math. That's my. Oh. That's what I. That's that's locked. Uh oh. That's and fair. I just did madness. I just clicked the wrong thing when I was looking that up. Oh, what happened? And it's going to be different next week. Um. No, that no, it's me. I just crowded. I oh. when I clicked it, it opened up every sticker. Hi, <laughs> so you've seen some ocean. You've seen some ocean. Um, yeah, and those are my log dives. Okay, okay, okay. When you got me with when you have somebody with you, I mean, I go up by myself all the time. Then because Amazing. other people disturb wildlife. <laughs> And now, they really are, know what they're doing. They, re, they disturb wildlife. And the people who really know what they're doing, down here, they're working. So when pretty. I want to explore, basically, I go out alone. Um, so we were talking about a few other things. Man, oh, yes, about your linkages. Okay, now, as far as verifying me, when this stuff started with Mandal Bay, and you're warning about scientists, because remember, Einstein was a scientist. Okay, he actually had yeah. his hands on and helped build a bomb, and he was shocked that they used the bomb. Okay, and this is the guy we call a genius. Okay, he right. built a bomb and then got upset when the bomb was used. What do you, I mean? Okay, if I open a can of soda, that's going down. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, so, okay, so how much? I mean, so when we talk about, oh, the scientists should be in charge of that. The scientists say this. The scientists say that. Let's remember now that there's a scientist working for the coal the coal companies. Yeah. Okay. Yep. There's the scientists, scientists working for guys. big oil. Okay. Um, and as far as talking to people is concerned, um, I don't even remember a margarine commercial years ago. Okay. And they, they, they were like, oh, margarine tastes so much like butter, you'll think it's the real thing. And to prove I do remember it, those. they gave it to Mother Nature, and she thought, and she said, no, this is really butter. And they said, no, oh, it's this brand margarine. And, she, and then the thunder and lightning blows up, and she said, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. <laughs> so, the company making the artificial product told people it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. And people ran out to the store and bought it. It bought margarine. They were like profits, but wrong profits. But in other words, the, the company itself told you Mother Nature doesn't like this stuff. And you right. went out and people went out and bought it. It's like so, a, there was some type of reverse psychology going on. So when you hear certain things, you got to take some things with a grain of salt. What I did when this thing came up, right? You had a bunch yeah. of people saying, but wait a minute. We had a presentation because permits were actually granted and we had to go, we, we had to go and, and get a stop order against them. Okay. okay. Because they had a scientist who came in and said there's no life there. Okay. 
it's just basically there's a few birds, a few fish, and if we put the hotels and stuff down, there's nothing that will be harmed, damaged, or interfered with. Okay, and like I've been visiting that place all my life. Okay, right. The, that one small area, there are thousands of species that reside there. Okay, um, the migratory birds, there are dozens of migratory birds that flock there. Okay, and I'm involved with the eBird program at Cornell University, tracking the birds on in the site. So I can okay. also send you a link where people can look at my tracking logs, the ones that have been verified. The verification is about two years behind date, but you know, scientists are looking at these and making sure images and, and the, the citations and everything else are correct. So that sure. takes time. Um, so I've been was tracking the birds in this region and everything else. I, it turns out to be a major migratory stop along the path down the islands towards South America or the other final destinations in other areas. So if you just go there one day, you might not see the giant flocks of birds. The flocks of birds are coming in for the migratory rest stop. They'll stay for a couple of weeks or a couple of months sometimes and then be on their way. Or every few years, some of them will decide, I'm going to stay for a couple of years. Okay. They act just like tourists. <laughs> okay. Some come down, like on the cruise ship, hopping from island to island to island before getting back to the mainland. <clears throat> okay. Others jump ship and say, hey, I like the island. I want to live here. And a few years later, the adventure bug hits them and they head off somewhere else. And then others say, hey, this is my home forever. Which is okay. Great. So yeah, so we have wildlife actually being introduced to the islands naturally that way, and these type of ecosystems, an island, all islands, okay, are areas where you can observe evolution happening at a much faster rate than on continents. Okay, Absolutely. and then in ecosystems like this, they are happening um, at, an, at an even faster rate. And what has actually happened is what I've been finding has actually scared me out of uh, out of giving species identifications. I'm sticking with genus right now until I have a DNA lab in my house. <laughs> okay, because um, we're still um, they're still discovering and describing things um, actively in the region. We're also finding out that some birds that we thought may have been one species. They moved them actually out of that air, out of out of the family into a whole next family. Sorry, genus into a whole nother genus. And it happens to be our island bird, the banana cake. Which they know which now if you look online today and look out up on it and come back in a month, you're gonna see different information. That's been happening for almost a year. Okay. You're gonna get a different island bird that well, is Well, and they're finding out bird. that this one bird that they thought that ranges only in the Caribbean and parts of South America may actually be um, a dozen subspecies or several species. And what's happening is the genome project. Remember that genome project that was cataloging all life on the planet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it never really got into the Caribbean, just peripheral. I mean, think about it. In this small area, if there, if there are 20, 000, more than 20,000 known species right now, okay, and we haven't gotten into everything. I mean... I'm talking and not scrolling through this slide, so I should put it on, should have put it on automatic, huh? Um, yeah, this one I think is um, a lot of your little bugs of the, that, that can be found in the area. And every yeah. once in a while, okay, you will find bugs here that like, wait a minute, that's a Florida bug, that's a New York bug, or that's a Rhode Island bug, okay? And it's like you're scratching your head, but no, we get tourists coming here all the time and stuff travels in luggage. Okay, the majority of them will not survive. You see, I mean, they're not going to survive long. There's, no, there's nothing to breed with. The temperature, the climate is completely different for them. But all of these shots here, um, come on, um, we're out of Mandal Bay. And that little guy, guy. <clears throat> yeah, he, he he's about, what was he about? A little, a little more than an eighth of an inch. We love a jumping spider on this channel. Yeah. So he's, yeah, he's a jumping spider. And unfortunately, I don't have the lens to get in closer and get better detail than that. But I'm going to keep trying because yeah. um, I was doing Mandal Bay and we, we stuck with the pretty, oh, wow. we, we, we stuck with the um, light that would attract um, supporters. Okay. Um, bugs didn't quite do it. <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely <laughs> not, not at the time because we still have a lot to go to get people to understand. We, we shouldn't be killing bugs as we see them. 
Right. Okay. Right. And, but here on the island, I mean, in the tropics too, where bugs can carry some pretty serious diseases. Okay. It's like spray every night for the mosquitoes. Make sure you spray and spray all the time and keep the roaches out of the house and everything else. The roaches are not indigenous. They were brought in, but they okay. carry some filth with them. So were roaches and so were rats and mice. Okay. okay. There were no mammals on the island except for bats before um, the arrival of was it came here first well let's just say europeans but i'm not going to go into which one got here first or not um they came in from europe the norway rat that big giant guy but yeah that's a pretty one and we used to i mean those are stink bugs and we used to play games with them as a child you know what you know what games children would play with a stink bug as a child right yeah we have them here too they're not yeah, as i'm not going to encourage any i'm not going to encourage any children so yeah we'll get we'll, we'll get you little <laughs> dragonflies and and I, I've stopped trying to mess with them because I think some of the color patterns and whatnot may change due to how much water, what type of minerals are around and what they're feeding on, et cetera. Because I'm looking at some of them and I'm saying they got to be the same species, but then the strike patterns go wrong and I can't find anything else in a book. But I'm no expert. So I say, throw these out here. People know what they are, or we know what to, but maybe by a photograph, have fun with them. Because um, I sent you some links where I put some pictures on Flickr, where I'll be updating. Yeah. Basically, I can put anything there, whether it's of a quality to go out on the other areas or not. So that because identification pictures don't have to be this super high quality stuff you just see splashing around the internet. I think that may discourage some people from taking the shots that they should take because right, you're not right. always set up to get that perfect shot. But what you need is evidence, proof of presence for your logbooks and everything else. And you can always go back and say, okay, this might not be a super focused picture of a butterfly, but I know that butterfly was there. I've got my exit information. You see it there on the bottom of the screen, my date taken and all that type of stuff. And I pulled it out of their directory for a copy, but it would have been in a directory that said what it's, where it was taken and everything else that gets in the exit info. Okay, so anytime in the future, even though it's not the clearest image in the world, it's like a lace I thing. know I know when I saw it. I know where I saw it. I know what time of day. It's good that this electronic data is all there. Okay. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah. So I and right here to um. Even to that, okay. What what that is, right? That's a discount. That's a, um, a gungalo. We call it a gungalo. It's a giant mill. It's yeah. a millipede. Yeah. Okay. That can get up to eight, eight, about eight inches long. It's black. I think there was one earlier that I showed. And they they shed their skin. Oh, this and is the shed. Yeah, that's the shed. That's why it's and you see it's aged out. That's why it's not black. Yeah, I was like, this looks really weird. Like it doesn't look right. Okay, that makes more sense now. Yeah, so some of these know, like if I decided I was going to throw it up and unsplash, it'd be respect, um, rejected because nobody would know what it is. It requires yeah. an explanation. Okay, because that is actually, if I go back a couple. It was right here. That, yeah, yeah. Right there. Oh. Yeah. And, it's so weird to see it in a tree. Like, that's a weird well, place to find a, a millipede. Well, I mean, they eat, they eat leaves. Um, yeah, this, is a, this is the tropics. That's true. Don't, ex That's true. don't expect normal to be normal. <laughs> it's remarkable. It's remarkable for us, uh, us in temperate zones. Look yeah. at these guys. Well, and and you see, that's one of the other weird things is because um, a scientist coming down here from the states to look at the same species that they've been looking at in on the mainland will find surprises. The species is not going to behave the same way as it does in the ecosystems on the mainland. Okay, and sense. tropical and tropical ecosystems are also fast changing ecosystems. We are naturally in the paths of hurricanes, although not the frequency that we have had. Let's put it this way, between 1960 and 1988, there were no hurricanes that hit my home. Okay. Okay, and this I can, I can verify because I was aware. Between 1989 okay. and 2022, we've had 14. Well, you said you just had them within a few months. Uh, uh, yeah, and then five. yeah, we've had we've had three double. We've had three. Um, okay, well, it would be six hurricanes, but we've had three pairs of hurricanes that have hit us within two weeks of each other. 
unbelievable in that time period. So the 27 years prior, no hurricanes at all. The 33 years since 1989, we've had 14 hurricanes, four of them category fives. That's okay. and that that's like a kind of an island ending level of hurricanes, well, two category well, fives and well. Right. Well, what happened was, yeah, we had more than 90% destruction. Okay. Our latest okay. experiment in um, solar energy went kaput because the whole hillside of tropical rainforest that was cleared to put in solar panels, the solar panels um, got all blown away by the hurricane. And they put in new ones now, rated, but the federal government hurricane rating is 160 miles per hour. And so that's what they okay. rated for. The solar farm that was destroyed before experienced gusts of 220 miles per hour. So that's, that's only 60 <laughs> miles per hour. It's fine. It's fine. So, so basic, basically, so we, so in in thinking about um, climate change and, and lobbying and whatnot, I have always never liked somebody coming into an area and saying this is what you need to do. Right. Okay. For a lot of those reasons, it's like, okay, we've been experimenting with solar power here since the seventies. And every time somebody goes into it, they got to get out of it and everything else. It just wasn't efficient enough. It couldn't survive storms, the corrosion. Same thing with large power windmills. We're oil born, burning right now. We burn oil saying, at our power panel. Yeah. You were saying and, that the, <laughs> the solar power panels, or the solar panels went down. So now your coal plant has to burn more coal. Yeah. Uh, yeah well, we're <laughs> using oil. Yeah. Oil, well, no, there's another, there's another issue too, which is where we say all climate issues are not the same worldwide. They have to be addressed individually, locally. Electric cars will kill us. Will kill us. We can't provide enough power right now to the homes on the island. Remember I was telling you about the outage we experienced over the weekend. Uh, most places on this island experience several power outages a week. That's almost okay. as bad as Texas. That's crazy. Right. So. Um, if you have people starting to come in with the electrical cars and we can't handle the grid right now as it is, we're going to have more crashes like we had last weekend. And what ends up happening is we got to burn more oil to compensate for it. So um, there are issues to think of. Um, it's not all solved by saying we're going to switch to this, we're going to switch to that. Different areas of the world will need different types of solutions. Okay, so... What happened with what, what's happening with Mandabi right now? And it's telling you we get this, we should get back to verification. <laughs> we drifted so far from that. Yeah. So after I, I started producing these images, putting them out there, people could find no place else. So I had to reach out. And who I went to, like when I'm saying knowing people and knowing how to reach them. Dr. Sylvia Earl. Um, she was a former lead, um, she was a former lead at um the at um EPA. She was a former head there. Okay. And she is also the first woman to live underwater, which was done offshore of St. Thomas. That was in the 60s. Okay. The underwater habitat that they were living in was um, closer to St. John in our waters, the waters of the St. Thomas St. John district. So that's Dr. Sylvia Earl. She also started a project called Mission Blue, together with um, the Ocean Elders, which are basically, it's a group of the richest people on the planet who are gathered together to protect the ocean. Okay. And so since she had the ties to the island, reached out to her and her organization, and they sent somebody down here, a photographer named Richard Gillette, to investigate. And then they put a team of people on it. And basically, um, once Mission Blue said, yeah, indeed, that's what's going on, that's when, all, that's when all support really took off to be able to save the area. Because um, okay. basically, yeah, she brought in a couple million people behind her. Okay, and at that point, that's when things seemed to crumble with the company and then the legislature canceled their hearings and behind the scenes, whatever really went on, <laughs> we didn't get. And also we used the children. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's a good word or a bad word to say use the children. We use the, ooh. I mean, we make, them, we, we make them wash our dishes, sweep the house and scrub the <laughs> toilet, right? So they can help clean up outdoors as well. <laughs> Hey, but our, our educate, but it, it, it turned out accidentally. We didn't plot it or plan it. But our educational outreach, where we were bringing kids down to the bay and everything else, <laughs> worked out that a whole bunch of parents or whatnot just decided that the developer decided he was going down there to show the media how safe their little place would be. Okay. And so parents decided, hey, 
this is more this is this is more important than school today. This is a homeschool day, and they took the kids down to Mandal Bay, and they're the ones who faced off with the developer. The parents of the kids or the kids? No, the kids. I stayed That's back. Awesome. I kept my people back. I don't like protests. You know why? You can't control what goes on. You That's can't true. control who's in it and who what side they are on. Right. Okay. And I was in politics for a long time. In truth, we don't listen. You lined up and told us what side you're on, so now we know how to pander to that. <laughs> right? Which, yeah. I mean, the better way to approach it is we always complain about, oh, it's who you know and who you blow. Well, <laughs> you don't you don't have to do anything bad, but it actually is who you know. Because it's all about people. Well, it sounds the, like it. it sounds like you finally got that million person uh, attraction to your cause. Uh, well, a million people did not have to sign up for the cause. It was linking an organization like Mission Blue. Right. Okay. Right. Which is also where to, there are a lot of people who say, like, okay, I want to do my citizen scientist. I'm going to run down and register my own nonprofit. Which that type of thing can a lot of times do more harm than good. I don't know what type of bug that is, right? By the way, it landed on the screen one day, and I took a picture. I don't think anyone knows what kind of bug that is. I have no, um, because also, I mean, we have birds that fly around at night and eat bugs. Right. So a bird or a bat or something may have gotten and raggled those wings, and now I can't figure out what the heck it is. But it looks like it has more than the proper amount of legs. <laughs> It looks like an alien. Like I don't know if that's yeah. I don't know I if like, that's two bugs breeding or what. Who what knows? I mean, I took it was on the screen. It was tiny. I saw it. I took the picture, and then it flew away. So that's what I got. Well, I could still fly. Uh, maybe one day somebody will decide decide for it, or maybe actually I scared away our first contact with alien life. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it looks like it has about ten legs, which is a weird number of legs, and. Uh, which also could be spines. Remember perspective. It's true. That's true. Yeah. Compared to a plume moth, well, maybe. Mm -hmm. Because there's so smart people watching the show. So. Yeah. So now, one of the key reasons I needed to bring in Mission Blue and their scientists was, remember, I told you, an environmental assessment report is always required for anything near the water. Okay. That has to, that's done by quote unquote scientists. Quoted. And their EAR -E concluded, bam, and we were, I was at the hearing and everything, and I said that, and I actually burst out, that's a lie, which my mother always said, don't tell people the lie, sometimes they're just mistaken. <laughs> but, I mean, it's a top tier biologist, and it has the other thing, they had logs of reports of their dives and surveys of the lagoon, where I had been taking school kids on field trips from the Department of Education where we have been having our summer environmental ranger program that had been going on since 2003. I had never seen these surveys. I never saw any of the dives or the studies. It was there on paper. They had pictures of them on shore and then they had pictures of a few little bit of wildlife. I never saw a study done, but this got turned into the government and pass the permitting review because the scientists verified it. What is a scientist? Remember, like I said before, the coal factories have scientists. <laughs> they, uh, Johnson yeah. and Johnson, they're being sued right now. They got scientists. Everybody has scientists. Okay. They are times when we got to verify for ourselves <clears throat> or figure out who exactly are the trusted organizations based on what they have done before. Okay, and what they continue to do. Because most scientists will not come out and tell you straight out, blah, 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 it's so. A scientist is a person who expects that their theories and hypotheses will be tested and that they will be shown wrong more often than right. That's true. That's true. Okay. Um, a scientist observes, they log their observations. Based on their education and experience, they can come to certain conclusions about their observations, but then they share that with others who then either go and review their work or come in and duplicate their research, etc. And once enough people have looked at it, reviewed it, and been able to come to the same unadulterated conclusion, then they can start saying, hey, we might have a fact on our hands. 
as citizen scientists, okay, remember now they have journals where they publish, things go out, and people in that community comment back on it. And that way you also see other perspectives which you didn't see yourself. Okay, and that's one of the reasons why when you said, would you like me to come on the show? I said, yes, it's another reason why it's here. Okay, I'll go ahead and spread um, my budget available for donations and sponsorships out to grassroots individuals. Okay, because now that's a check and balance on the institution. Yeah. And okay, a lot of you have a lot of smart people who have logged into your show. Okay, you obviously you have a you you have a network because one of the ways I found you was through Aquarimax. Oh, excellent, excellent. Okay, and it was the um the Taylor Swift Scorpion. Okay, okay. And he, and, and yeah, and it was through him he came and asked a question about it on your show, and that's how I got linked into you. Fantastic. I don't even recall that. That was a few months ago. Yes, I was wondering. I was wondering where and when you came in. Okay, so. and now here's the thing, right? A scientist is not afraid to be wrong. If he has done his work well and through his work, he has come to such and such a conclusion, it's actually exciting to find out, hey, that's another train of thought that may have a different perspective and may say, hey, okay, your conclusion, while well done, may not be the end all to, of the end all. Okay, that's how we advance. That's how we develop. It's actually how we got to the climate crisis, too, which was, in my opinion, don't blame so much people in the past. You can blame people who continue now. We didn't know. Okay, how did we find out that certain berries were poisonous? Did we put them in a test tube and do a chemical test? We can no, do you that today. Watch fall down. No, yeah, yeah, exactly. So the industrial age, when it came along, okay, <clears throat> Um, there was really no way to know what even all these chemicals were that they were using, playing around with, experimenting with, and actually experimenting on a societal basis, which is how they got to pay for all of this stuff. Okay, and there were times throughout history where, like, London had to be evacuated, and London figured out, hey, we got to move these factories outside of London. But somehow the two and two didn't come together that, hey, we need to put filters on the factories. <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, these type of things, it's a learning process through stages of time. And the problems come in is when people learn it and either cover it up or don't share it. Those are the type of things yeah. we need to go after. The other things are corrective actions where we need to continue to push evolution a lot. The evolution of our technology to the point where basically you see on Star Trek, they're not worried about any type of pollution, but they're using more energy than a star every time they move. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay, that's a clean energy dream, which entropy says will never actually happen. So we're just trying to stretch things out because we got maybe, I mean, time's coming short. What's the universe got? About two or three trillion years left? Yeah, something like that. I mean, I'm trying to sell off my assets so we can just enjoy life yeah. for that time. But, but I had talked to you a little earlier about how dangerous it is in space. So yeah. it's actually, I mean, this thing about people are talking about we're going to get to, uh, the rich people are going to live in their habitat and out of space and everything else. So they don't need to worry about Earth. Um, that is so foolish and impractical a thought that we need to really turn around and say, hey, okay, what am I doing to make certain that our necessary urban crawl and growth does not impact vital areas. Mandal Bay is what's called by the Department of Interior, um, Fish and, Division of Fish and Wildlife, a nursery habitat. Okay, one of the crucial okay. things about it, you saw the amount of fish that were running through there. You saw the amount of different species. Yeah, that I would video. love to touch one of those. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's great, actually. I'm not as scary as people would think, even though they are predators hunting through it at the same time. Um, they're not stupid. <laughs> they don't bump into us and they don't hunt things all sides. Right. They think we're not they think we're another predator there too, just going in for a snack. So as long as you don't interfere with them, they leave you alone. It's quite yeah. different than on land. If you approach a wolf pack snacking, one of them is gonna come out and attack you, they're not gonna want to share. Right. Okay, but in the but in the ocean it's like big rules. Yeah. You're about to say something? Yeah, go back one picture if you could to that webbed uh it's got to be some yeah. kind of egg sac, right? It looks yes, like an probably... egg sac. 
I don't know what it's for, but it was hanging out there. The sun was glistening off of it, and I said, that needs a picture. I bet that's like a tent caterpillar thing like we have in Illinois. Mm -hmm. I'm going to bet there's caterpillars in there. But don't quote me on that. I don't know for sure. Well, what's going to what's gonna happen is doing all this stuff for Mandabe, like I said, I was concentrating on the larger critters. And actually, um, I learned as I went, and I didn't come out with things until I had taken, like, each, each thing I took a couple of years, actually, each each form of life, between sure. reptiles, between between the fish and getting down there and diving and being able to figure out, okay, how do I stay still to keep a fish near me that's not used to seeing a human? Yeah. If you're on a regular dive tour, the fish ain't going nowhere. But if you're out exploring, okay, and these things have never seen something as large as a human before. Right. You actually you you actually have to spend time when when I say time, days and weeks, just down there showing them that you're not a threat. Okay. Okay. Not interacting with them, just going about your business and everything else, and then eventually things calm down into a more natural state. Um, the fair with that is when people other people come and discover some areas like that. If they're used to seeing a human and knowing a human there's no harm and they come in with their spare guns or nets and all that type of stuff, they're right, sitting and that's over with. Yeah. Okay. So um, we have a lot of hidden areas around the island and stuff like that. These animals actually do probably interact with humans in other areas because you can't, because they do end up adjusting and at okay. a faster rate than you might see in the wild. So, I mean, there are a few wild areas left on the island for certain. That's a walking stick, which by the way, we do have here. And that's one of our little, little critters. And those guys make webs that you might swear is the strongest fishing line when you run into them. I've seen right birds. The I've, they'll put it right in your nose, apparently. <laughs> well, um, that was an assistant <laughs> who was working with, with me, and I told her, go around to the other side there. And Okay. Um, she used to jump out of helicopters in the military, so she's not one of them who was afraid oh, to get wow. her face that close in. Um, yeah, that spider's leg span is about like that. Um, what's that about four inches? Yeah, they um, use them. Uh, they use the spider web as fishing line in Africa. There's tribes mm -hmm. that'll use the giant orb weavers. Um, yeah. They have the special paddle that they collect it with, so it's all wrapped in one direction, and then they go back home and use that well, silk as and fishing line. Right now is also the time of year when um, there are a lot of young, and so when you're walking through the forest, you're just getting them. They're floating through the air. You just get webs across your face. <laughs> That's my and, basement yeah. right now. <laughs> <laughs> and those, well, that's my laundry room. I, I, I decided I'm going to grow a crop of them in the roof of the laundry room. It's an outdoor laundry room. so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We don't have any poisonous spiders here, but I really would like to see their life cycle, um, what they do. I actually was able to get a video of a male courting a female. He oh, did wow. everything right, and then nature messed him over. So okay. he, he, he brought her the presents. She was sipping on the present and he started stroking her and, you know, getting her into a little hypnotic trance and everything else. That took him about an hour and all, right? And, he, and she opened up and was all accepting. And then this hard gust of wind came <laughs> and she spun around and ate him. I mean, well, uh, you know, did the bite and he cre creeped off, and a few minutes later, he just sagged in the web, a dog hanging dead. Uh, it's like he was all gentle. He did all this hypnotic thing, and then, and actually, it's difficult sometimes to get things in focus here because we always have a tropical breeze coming through. So that's one thing I've got to figure out. I'm going to start studying these bugs more and getting more close-up images. But they're on leaves, they're on branches, and the wind is always blowing. So it's yeah, like I don't know. I don't know of a spot where pictures of bugs saved an environment or started a movement. It, it could in this group, but I, I can't imagine. Well, let's put something this way, right? And I don't know <laughs> if I have any pictures up here for you. Oh, termites down here. Okay, they're disgusting. Okay, and we have a term. We have a termite that bores through concrete, and we actually imported it to Florida a decade or so ago. So they got that problem now too. It's like it will actually pull out the grains of sand and concrete and bore a hole in your concrete to get in your house. Okay, and in Florida, they found out that it actually went through the, the cement, uh, with the underlying cement on roads to get to crossroads. But okay. anyways, um, these industrious critters, right? Um, they build these mounds, these big round mounds, and I've seen them up to six feet around. Okay. Okay, but I have timed them. Okay, from when a queen lands, 
okay, you can get one that's a little bigger than a grapefruit in about a week, and then about two cubic feet in about two weeks. And that stuff, I've actually, when I've taken them down, I poured water on them and compressed them, makes a pretty good cardboard. Mix them with the spider, mix them with the web from these spiders. <laughs> okay. And I, I think you've got press board that you can make furniture with. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I mean, but the other thing about the about the other thing about these termites is like, I mean, they go through anything. All right, most of your woods from the from the main um white pine. Oh my gosh, that's gonna collapse on you in months. Um, you need something that recycles. Bugs are recyclers. Oh, and when we look, and when we look at bugs, and realize that most of these bugs are bare chemical commands. <laughs> it's a chemical that gets a re that reacts in a certain way. When we figure that out, these little buggers will be taking the rot out of the woods and building houses for us, which would be great. They'd have their own air conditioning and heating and thermal regulating houses, and and their, their homes stand up to hurricanes. They seem like paper, little leads way for thin, thin little things, but that's their structure. And I'm, I'm seeing if I can find one for you without going through trouble. Oh, and that's a centipede. Not a millipede, that's a centipede. Yeah. And that's a booger you don't want to mess with. I. That's my one nope. That's a hard nope animal for me. So okay, these guys I, are pretty toxic. Yours, yours are pretty toxic. Um. So I have heard <laughs> um, there may be a number of species that were not... Hey, around St. Thomas when I was young, they were on St. Croix, but travel back and forth, I think, is what has brought them here and made them more evident. Okay. Um, I've heard tales from crucians that they can knock down a grown man, which is what we say when an animal is toxic enough to take a 350-pound guy and put him slammed down. <laughs> Not, as compared to just making a child sick. But what I do know about one like that stung my cousin in St. Croix. Okay. And it caused an abscess on her thigh that they couldn't stop from growing. And it, it, it kept necrotizing until basically she had a fist-sized chunk of flesh that just had to be taken out of her thigh, and she still got the gap there to the state. Now that could have uh, been a cellul that could have been a cellulitis from it from dirt or uh, whatever stung her, or it could have been a toxin. I, I have no idea. And most times, if you have something and go into the hospital with it, if you didn't capture the animal that did it, you know. <laughs> They'll never really know what it was. Now, this hair should not have been yeah. on St. Thomas. That should have been in Florida. The giant water beetle? Yeah. Yeah, that should have been in Florida. I found it here in St. Thomas. I've only ever found it once, so that leads me to believe. And actually found <clears> this <throat> on the wall at the campground across from Mandal Bay. Okay, so I actually believe right. that this came in in somebody's luggage or hitchhiked on a bird or something like that, and, have, and there's no way that he's going to survive. Okay, okay, but we get things like that. Now, him, <clears throat> that's um, a little St. Andrew's bug. Um, that's a nickname I know for it. Um, he, that's a little baby one. Okay, yeah. and I'm show you a couple of, well, that's your little ladybug, but I thought they were in sequence. That's a gravid fly. Let me see okay. if I can get him bigger. Yeah, see his little. Oh yeah. Yeah, and see it's it's yeah, and you can actually see that started to put it that started to put down. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. See, so it doesn't matter if you have that macro lens. You're you got all that detail right here. You can see the eggs. Yeah. Well, I'm right now. I don't. What was this one shot with? Is it on here? Um, I have so many different cameras, I can't always tell you which one I use at a particular time. Um, let me go back to that and get the exit from full. Sorry. Um, I need to come out so I get it for the right one. I'll tell you what camera that use. That use, um, that was using the Nikon D90. Okay. So that was a 35 millimeter. I have, I'm using an X7 mostly now. So that's get, that's like resolution off the scale it, because it's giving you an image size that's like eight thousand uh, pixels on one side. Oh wow! Okay. Okay, so there's your orb weaver again, and that one has a little present. Um, it was a fly, but I couldn't get an angle. He was up in the tree. 
Okay. And so these guys have snagged birds and they've they've sent webs across. And you can sometimes you see a web that stretches across the street, like from one tree branch to another, or from a telephone pole to another. It's so crazy how they <clears> do that. And all these little flies and mosquitoes. Now, this definitely didn't belong in St. Thomas, and I hoped I would never ever see it again on St. Thomas. Okay. That's your locus. Right? Oh, wow. Yeah. If I'm wrong, one of you guys could correct me, but that's like a Florida bug that ends up here every once in a while because it's another one that hops into lodging. Okay. And I'm just hoping that never makes a foothold here because those guys can tear apart a region in an instant. If they... Now, what is the uh, the practice for that? So when you find these guys that are clearly invasive, do you just go ahead and, and murder it or just kind of try to let nature take its course? Um, I've never been in the murdering mood. So I've never put anything, I've never really been able to just say, okay, you don't belong here, I'm going to kill you, except that I was trained to do that for our lionfish. Okay, I do have okay. my certification as a lionfish hunter, and I can also do that in our local natural park waters. We got the yellow card and the red card. Um, <clears throat> so those I take out of our space as we see them. Now, all, life, uh, all native indigenous life on St. Thomas is protected by law. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean you can just do what you want with any life you see. If it's a pest, our law says, okay, you can get rid of it by any means necessary. It's not necessarily animal cruelty. So you see bugs like this. Uh, most Virgin Islanders are not going to have a problem anyways. You see a bug, they kill it. Okay. Okay, I mean, it's like we don't like bugs. But, I mean, that comes from our history. I mean, remember tropical diseases were rampant. Yeah, okay, and bugs, and bugs are really what spread them. Oh, I hope that doesn't make too much noise. That's an um, air pump just came out of the tanks. I don't know if you can hear it. <laughs> it was just a little beep. I don't think that's a problem. Okay. And that's your carpenter, which uh, passion fruits are, are real wild here. Um, there's a native passiform, a couple of native passiforms, and the rest. Um, a lot of our plants now are actually invasive and come from India and Asia. Um, as a matter of fact, if you go to Vietnam and you go to St. Thomas, you go yeah. to Vietnam, the southern part of Vietnam, you'd swear you were in St. Thomas. The vegetation is um, exactly the same and everything else. That's just how much um, wow. plantation settlement was done throughout the Caribbean um, during the colonial era, during the slave era. Yeah, um, sure. So basically, St. Thomas was the hub of the trading center. Okay, oh, and so we yeah. had, yeah, so we had estates and plantations all over the place. So, um, a majority of the landscape on St. Thomas is not what it is, not the original life, the original sure. plants. Sure, we do have, we do have, we still do have indigenous plants, indigenous rainforests, and everything else. But I mean, even to this day, they're being taken over, it's being taken over at a rapid pace, um, especially with the back to back hurricanes. Because nature does take care of hurricanes. We do have life forms that only show up after hurricanes. But the frequency of our hurricanes has interrupted that cycle as well. Now, what we have up here is a life form that you find at Mandal Bay that was actually discovered from, I think, in the 20th century. This is the, this um, family is the only insects that you can find on, in the middle of the ocean. I have seen these on octonauts. So yeah, I know a little bit about these guys. Yeah, halibates, the sea skaters. Now, we have we have several species here on St. Thomas, and supposedly they're not very well studied. Uh, Mandal has two of the species, which is an unusual interaction, because supposedly they figure out how to find their own space between the different species that don't really make, mingle and interact. Even okay. small areas, they'll all go to their little corner and hold their space. But <clears throat> um, I just have these as halibate sea skate, because... To get an ide a full identification on these critters without capture and kill is impossible. To get a real proper identification. Okay. And they move fast. Okay. Um, but if you see a video of them, they're like, move, they're, they're like <laughs> across the water. So it's like, yeah, yeah, you have to use a, yeah, you got to use a very high shutter speed to get them. And remember, this is the ocean, not a lake. Right. So right. these guys, I mean, I've, okay, this, this, this is out in the bay area of Mandal. Okay, now this is in the lagoon where the water is green. That's them all there. And this one guy decided he wanted to um, stand up and say hi to me. 
Now, these are the low resolution ones because I posted these to Facebook, but I have higher resolution, so I'll have to get that. <laughs> and it's like, all the editors are down there, and he's got to be up on top. It's like, okay, <laughs> we found the leader of the herd. There's <laughs> one guy there, he's like, Carl, get the word out. We got to okay, get no, saved. I, now, hey, I don't know if you can tell the perspective, but that's but the ocean that that is a wave sweeping up, and they, they like just they just have fun on the ocean waves. They'll come in and out of the lagoon. I have no that's idea so what that is. Looks like a silverfish. Yeah, he was there, but he wasn't silver. <laughs> Which no, we have there is, a, there is a heck of a lot of ultraviolet lighting, and underneath the canopy, like like um. The, um, a mangrove trees and several of the, the sh other shoreline trees, which are technically mangroves because they, um, you can technically call anything a mangrove that can live in both fresh and salt water. Okay. 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 So the whole range of trees <clears throat> along that, that, that coast um, can change your lighting. And not so that you visually see it, but in your camera, it can change. Okay. And sometimes our light forms that's actually fluoresce. Wow. Now, this was nice to see. We don't know what brought them, but we were doing construction, a um, couple cabins, and they just decided, okay, we're going to set up shop and hover here for a little while. And they stayed for a couple of weeks and then went about their business. So, so what wild. that was about, I don't know. But yeah, we do have bees that hover around regularly. And like the rest of the world, our bee population is visibly dropped. <laughs> and okay. right now it's butterfly season. Is that have you found that with the bees in your native species, or is it just the honeybees, the imported honeybees? Um, I really don't know if all bees are native or okay. if they're different species in um, other places in the world. And like I said, I'm going to study up on more of what's happening with all insects and bugs. But the other thing is, is that it's most pretty of fascinating. There's a huge undertaking. Yeah, most of them have not been illustrated. It's just you just got to read text okay. and figure out all of that stuff. Katie did. Um, those exist here, and oh, yeah. yeah, they'll stare you down. They're savages. I didn't realize that they uh, could be predatory, or were predatory, and they. Oh, I've seen. I, I've I, I've seen one deal with a cockroach. Yeah, they're savages. It's it's really like crazy to watch them eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those bees. Guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but do those not look like European bees that were there? Those um, look like just which honey one bees. The they're, bees they're, that they're you honey. had up look like honeybees, so I'm pretty sure. Yeah, um, I'm no expert either, but I'm. I'm like yeah, in the we'll, we'll see, every once in a while you see swarms or roam the island or get into somebody's attic or whatnot. And what happens now is we actually do have beekeepers here who will yeah. come and collect them, but we don't want them killed anymore. And we do it. And supposedly, honey made from our local trees is the best tasting in the world, but I didn't say that. <laughs> well, let's export it. Sorry, I'm re I'm relocating ants as we speak here. Okay. okay. Now, our wasps. We have several species that. Um, okay, that's beautiful. I think it's two that act that look like um, species you find other places, but are actually indigenous to here and are a separate species, but they okay. look alike. So, like, there's a lady who deals with that stuff here. So I don't mess with the identification. But one thing we all say. <laughs> Okay, you, you don't go near them when you're sweating. Okay. Okay, and they, they'll, 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 they'll put their little hives underneath leaves in the bush and everything else when we're cutting our leaves. But we still got we still do a lot of cutting with machete and whatnot to get our lawns done. Right. Um, they, will, they will hunt you and put the water on your skin. So unlike, unlike your bees, if you decide, oh, I can just stay still and he'll leave you alone. He's like, aha. Me ready to eat, <laughs> and, and they don't have barbs, so they can, so they'll they'll come on you and start drinking, and when you don't, you get, you're not even noticing it's a thing on you. When you go to brush it off, it will sting you. Oh, of and, course, and come back and sting you again, and sting you again, and go and get his friends and come back. But unlike a honeybee, they're not barbed; they can just keep going. I have been okay. recently talked into leaving wasps alone um, by one of the guests we had on the show. Uh, who was actually like visibly cross with me about talking about killing wasps. And I haven't had any problems since, but my, with all bugs, my rule is out. If I invite you onto my body, I'm okay with it. If you just show up on my body, 
I'm not responsible for what happens to you. Okay. Well, the thing about these is is that um, there are people who are allergic enough to these wash to be hospitalized, and my brother was one of them. Oh, geez. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. His arms swole up like two thighs. <laughs> okay. It's like in the hospital, it's like, okay, people can really live with a Popeye arm. It went on. <laughs> but I mean, seriously, it was Popeye. <laughs> That's crazy. This is a beautiful wasp. I think that, like, I'm not a fan of wasps, but this one is gorgeous. Okay, yeah. Well, for your fan who doesn't like the killing of the wasp, if they get under the roof of, of your house or if you park the car up for a couple of weeks or whatnot, you will want to spray them. Um, you'll have a different view when you start your car up and they come in through your air conditioner filter. That would be because they, they happen Because, I mean, yeah, if you park your car for a couple of weeks, you Chances are Jack Spines will move in under your engine or under that dash the filter for your air conditioner under the dashboard. Uh, and that can be a treat while driving. Well, that's situational. I feel like that's situational. That's fine. Look at this guy. Yeah, that's your gungalow again. Oh, um, no massive millipede. He was wet, so I took a picture. Because it was, it's beating like somebody waxed him. Yeah, it looks really cool. But of course, they gotta have a way to get that stuff off the skin, or what water off the skin. Otherwise, they can drop, they'll drown in the rain, right? So yeah. the beating serves a good purpose. Now, are these guys um, toxic as well? As a, I know, a lot of milk. Um, species have been toxic, no, so. they no, um, they don't do you any harm, except that if you like, you let them crawl on you and everything else. But if one gets pissed yeah. at you, what it does is it can spray poop. Okay. Which is always fun because their poop stinks. Yeah, it's yeah, like a defensive pains. mechanism. It's not great. Um, um, there's a big. You don't there. like getting showered with insect poop? Not not on Tuesdays. They say it's not good for Tuesdays. shampooing. <laughs> okay, see, there's a there's a bee again, and it's like one thing with yes. animals is that they get different perspective and shapes and angles can make you think an animal is a different species when it's actually the same species the lighting changes and etc sure so that's so that's why i like i will take a picture post them and let your experts decide whatever the heck it is that i got yeah i can't wait to post those links so um okay yeah i got it oh yeah okay you, you have them so you can give them to your people yeah yeah and these guys, I can't tell Monarch from Viceroy or any other butterfly that has that same coloration and similar pattern, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. Um, we yeah. find these here. You also find them in Florida. So, okay. But, um, so, what are the other, other questions regarding Mandabe, how we saved it, or other things, what we do with it today? Because we actually do a lot of research out of there now as well, which was, yeah. to, um, which is one of the ways that we're keeping development hands off by keeping the research going, the interest going. Um, that spider was on the same leaf as a praying mantis and both of them ignored each other. That's crazy. That well, the uh, yeah. praying mantis didn't go for it. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, it's like, like a crab spider. Maybe it's just too small to mess with. Maybe. Um, yeah, okay, now that's a walking know. stick. Huh? Well, yeah. that's a vegetarian. They come out at night, so... Very few people even know that these exist on the island because they're, they're so hard to find and see. Oh, and they're so camouflaged. You really have to either find them in a weird spot or really be looking. Mm -hmm. These are great pictures. This is usually end of life stage. Okay. Um, good place to catch pictures of butterflies when they land on the ground and just stay there fluttering near the ground. Um, this guy landed on my computer screen one day. I have no idea what he is or was. Um, took a picture. He continued walking off the screen and went about his business. I have no idea what that is. It's like a slipper with legs. Yeah, when he's tiny. Because, I mean, what are we looking at there? Those are pixels? That's not a yeah. um I wonder if that's some kind of leaf hopper. One of those guys. Sorry, I've got to really get him. in there. <clears throat> I think that's some kind of leaf hopper. That'd be my guess. They come in and such he, weird he shapes. Got, and he definitely got spots. Yeah, nice little, um, definitely. yeah what do you guys Sorry. think? Sorry. I keep messing up my controls. That's Sorry, okay. I was trying to move it over, but I think I don't have my proper controller. 
every time I so I wanted to ask I wanted to ask you um, back to the conservation of Mandal Bay. So how long did that process take before you finally saw some results? Like okay, well the first thing the first thing where they initially presented that that um, false report was in two thousand and eight. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so it was from there. But while I was at the hearing and I was like, look, she's lying, she's lying. How can it pass this permit? Everything else, blah, 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 blah. And this one guy who lived in the area said, well, we know they're lying. The government doesn't know they're lying. So how will you prove it? Okay. okay and that's what triggered me. Now, I didn't know anything that could go up against the scientists at that time. Okay. They went to court and got things delayed. Okay, based on certain deed restrictions in the area. In the meantime, okay. I started exploring more. I started learning more. And now things got, they lost their investor. So everybody was like, okay, that's done. But 2014, it popped back up on the radar and they had several politicians on their side. The governor announced that he announced a signed lease. <clears throat> he announced the negotiations had concluded and the lease was being signed on the day that he signed the lease. Yeah. Okay. So that started the whole uproar move. That started the whole uproar among the people who were sensitive to it. Okay. Now the story that went out to the business community in advance were talking about how many jobs would come in. Okay. And how I saw that would too. Get this boom and all this yeah, type I... of stuff. But um I knew a lot of these business people from before. Okay. Um my early life, actually I was an art director in a print shop. Before okay. people had printers on their desktops, so everybody had to come to your print shop to get your stuff done. So that put that gave me a lot of contacts from there into journalism, then into legislature. So there were a lot of business people who, once I showed them the imagery that I was getting from Randall Bay, were like, uh, okay, um, Chamber of Commerce is supposed to take a position on this. Um, and I don't want to mess anything up. I'm on your side, just don't tell them. <laughs> so I and yes, <clears throat> now they knew me well enough that I would keep their confidence. Okay. Okay. Because um, they did put certain these people that weren't joking around. They did put certain resources behind it and things like it's a small island. So if you make an enemy, you can make an enemy for life. And business people are like shy. So the so I knew which ones I could trust. That's why I say know your people again. And so those okay. ones basically behind the scenes. Worked on it so that by the time we got to the Chamber of Commerce, Chamber of Commerce decided we're not going to take we're not we're not going to take a stance, and I don't think they know where that came from. But it's called lobbying. Yeah, it's called yeah. lobbying. It's done in the halls of Congress all the time. If you can, if you know somebody and you can get to speak to them, you speak to them. Okay, you don't have to spend a ton of money either. You build those relationships. You're supposed to be able to talk to your representative for free. Absolutely. I know you're supposed to. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. Well, I mean, I'm I like I, I had 22 years in politics, and I could see absolutely no reason why there needs to be a pay system in order to get in to see a representative or or somebody on staff who can handle your issue. That is just pure. I don't want to call it. You can't call it corruption because it's legal. Paid lobby. The paid lobbyists. Yeah. But is it possibly a golden tortoise beetle? Yeah, that's what we're thinking. This is, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's a system which, okay, if they're taking advantage of it, we should not figure out how to take advantage of it. But we don't need money. We really don't need a ton of money. You know how much money was raised for this man now, the campaign? No, nothing. So, it just took people getting together and people and getting together, the word of mouth, not BSing not exaggerating in order to try and make a point and get people there, not being radical. Okay. You know why? Being radical gets you radicals. Being conservative gets you conservatives. But what if you want all of them? Yeah, just need people. A conserv being conservative will get you radicals, but being radical will not get you conservative. So I, you take a neutral middle of the line stance. I didn't go conservative. I did not go liberal straight presentation of the facts. Keep it like to that. that and you will never ever go wrong. I just did what I found and saw 
I presented. I never made a speech saying, do this, blah, 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 blah. Come on, join this, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a word for it. When you just let something sit and it grows, people start, people spread it and share it. And that's what happened around the island. That's Basically. the grassroots. That's that's what yeah. you're talking about. But, um, this thing, this thing actually centered on Facebook more than anywhere oh. else. Yeah, I had put up some videos on YouTube, put up some on Vimeo, a couple of other things, and you really needed a following. But on Facebook, yeah. I had already we had already had thousands of people. Okay. Okay. So basically, if you go on YouTube and those things, like I think my YouTube it was six years since I posted anything there. So the movement really sprang up on Facebook, and there is a group on Facebook called Save Man Army. Okay. Okay. The membership has dwindled some since there's been no activity. It's like people really only stick around when the bad guy is there, <laughs> and he yeah. comes back when people disappear. So it's like you got to figure out how to keep things rolling during the times when you don't see the big giant action occurring. But if you yeah, don't, right. they're gonna. That's when they sneak in. And that's why we keep research going. Um, our kids, um, they build their own um, robotic submarines. We call them um, submersible um, remote observation vehicles. So okay. our school kids and whatnot, um, we've been building them for uh, more than a decade. Um, we actually got, when we first started doing it, we actually got invited to a science convention <clears throat> um, where these kids who were ninth and 10th graders got to present at a full science convention as to how these devices could be used to enhance and study the protection of mangrove lagoons, which right now you can't see under there. So if you want, say you're going to dive underneath the mangrove lagoon, um, it's a high risk. And I've been under there where visibility has been like inches and something the size of my body has passed by. But that's like, I mean, there's tarpons, there's sharks, there's dolphins, there's snow. Right. Okay. And they probably and, well, go in there to rest, right? They probably go in there to rest. Mate. Okay. It's a nursery habitat. Most of them, most of those larger animals, when they go in there, they're going in there to eat, to um, lay or give birth. And, and now they got some goofy it. human coming in there and interrupting their their love time. Ah. Okay. Yeah, it was scrolling the wrong direction. Yeah, we can keep talking while I'm doing this. Let people see him. Yeah, see that. Yeah, absolutely. One. We can just let it go through. Um, yeah, I was just fascinated with. Well, I mean, there's so much to be fascinated about here, but um, how you got it together and got it coherent enough to make a change, and to I think a lot of people today in any environmental thing, uh, any environmental cause, are just daunted by the just. It seems like huge opposition. Um, I had an argument recently, I wanted to call it a discussion, but it was an argument. Um, and I call it that because when somebody has their point and their point is so stupid that I can't, I can't even comprehend it or like let it go. Um, it was about uh, green, green alternatives to energy, right? So using windmills, solar power. Um, I've seen some really cool studies about how to use the power from waves. Um, um, if, if you really look into the history of that, the first experiments were actually done here off of St. Croix. I believe it. A company called OTEC and everything else. And then they left for Hawaii and then got into the Bahamas. And then, yeah, we had we had three different companies. Um, one was doing the, um, sending down a pipe where it would change the temperature differential. Okay. Um, would generate energy because we got the third, we got the third deepest part of the ocean right next door. Well, I've seen different ones where it's like a float on a pole and the mm -hmm. waves bring the float up and down and that generates energy. Um, there's one where there's like these metal interconnected snakes that the waves yeah. push the, the connectors up and down and that generates yeah. energy. But um, and, yeah, our legislature eventually got rid of all of them. Oh, um, the, well, I, I mean, the technology and potential at the time was working out more like a scam than an actual um, progression of engineering based I on what see. was going on. Yeah, so that's bad. So the legislature lost confidence and said, nope, and they revoked all the permits. And that's when they left and were trying Hawaii and Bahamas. Well, and it's weird because you hear from the alternate energy uh, opposition that they're, it's all about the money. And it's like, do, so you're defending big oil for not being there for the money? Are you, are you serious? What needs to happen, okay, 
Uh, engineering, engineering like math, science, etc., needs to be a core um, class in school <clears throat> from grade school. Okay, let me tell you something about the West Indies. Um, we have something called carnival where we build these boots, they're wooden structures, and it's like we put them up in a day. Okay, and it's like okay. twenty foot by twenty four foot galvanized roof. We run electrical in them, we cook in stoves in them, and then we sell our traditional food out of them for carnival. And it's a tradition where we build them because, and that actually came from how we had to build houses in the past when an emergency came or whatever. You could knock people, few people get together and knock them together. I was six years old when I started doing that thing, that construction with my father. Okay. Okay, which like we said, like we were having a discussion earlier. We, we, kids don't do that these days. However, that doesn't stop them from getting that engineering learning early because what's going to happen is that the current state of technology of alternative energy is not quite fair. Okay, electrical cars are requiring in certain areas a higher burn of coal and, and oil and stuff like that. Windmills break down, um, they're not efficient, there's certain wildlife that is still. What we need is people thinking from the junior years, like capitalists. I'm gonna make money by finding the neutral energy source or the near neutral energy source. And the only way we can do that is that people thinking like that from when they're young. You're gonna find more engineers from when they're young if it's a core curriculum course. Okay, and that's linked to climate. Because remember, we live longer, we have better health, we have better food and nutrition and everything else, although we've abused it so that some of that's declining because of the industrialization. What needs to happen now is the development of industries that safe the industry, industrialization. Because we're not going backwards. Nobody ain't gonna want to go backwards and we can see that anthropologically. You introduce electricity to a community that was happy <coughs> with lanterns and campfire, they become dependent on that electricity. They don't want to get rid of it. Anymore. Okay, right. which is safer because you your food and all that type of stuff. So we are going to burn energy. Okay, the key is we're jumping up and down, we're protesting, we're saying stop this, stop that, but we want certain things, but no, but we're not providing a way to say, hey, here's how we're going to replace it. It has to be gone in at a reasoned approach and you have to have the things in place that can reasonably replace them. Anything that we do right. today is going to be the same as at the beginning. All our resources are natural, and we're converting them into something that we can use. So we've also got to figure out ways to put these things back, because you know what happens with a chemical change. You don't get back to the original substance. Right. Okay. Right. You're stuck so, with what which, you've got. Which also means preservation of nursery habitats like Mandal Bay, collectors and life preservers like you and your buddies who keep these collections and everything else. Um, you could come a point where those are the source species to repopulate areas or to, to do studies from rather than getting creatures out of the wild where we can see what these creatures can do for us and how they can help us. Because... There's a lot of medicinal value to a lot of these creatures that we have here. They were looking at mangroves years ago as um, better treatment for things like AIDS, sunburn protection, mosquito repellents, etc. But again, where's the investment? If you get people invested in these type of things, because a cow is not going extinct anytime soon. The pig no. is not going extinct anytime soon. Because we figured out that we can make a profit off of them. Which is weird because they're so delicious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, when, I'm not going. I'm not going as far as eating bugs. I've had people come here to go on tours, and then it's like they grab a bug off a tree and pop it in their mouth, and it's like, "Are you crazy?" And they say, "Oh no, bugs are good to eat. You're doing on TV all the time." I said, "Do you know what you just ate?" Yeah, bug? you don't know. You don't Unless know you... it. Even if it is the same bug that you met on the mainland, you don't know how it has adapted to him. Okay? Yeah. I can tell you there's a crab called a duppy, a land crab. It gets big. We use it in our dishes for crab and rice. Okay? You can just okay. go and shine a flashlight on them. We freeze them. You pick them up with your hand and put it in our bucket. You go in full moon nights and collect them. They're all over okay. the place. Okay? But the duppy feeds on the mansion eels. They're, okay. they're scavenger. They're, they're an omnivore scavenger, but the preferred, like, decayed leaves and stuff more than anything else. 
Okay, so fallen fruit and things like that. They live in regions where there's a lot of manchamine, which is considered one of the most deadly poisons on earth. Okay, so you can pick up this crab and go home and boil it and eat it and be fine. Or you can pick up that crab, go home, boil it and eat it and constrict your throat and your stomach and stuff up within moments and drop dead. Okay, what yeah, an animal awesome. had it look. You, you can see it more in life in the tropics than you can on the mainland. What an animal has been eating can Pay remain attention. in its system for a certain amount of time. So when we go crabbing, you don't eat crabs on a full moon night. You Just let them, you, you have to purge them. Okay, you, 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 you throw rice or you throw grass or some type of thing in, in, in the bucket with them and they eat that for several days. And if they were eating any toxins, it is now purged and flushed out of their system. That's crazy how it doesn't take that long. Like that's your isopod. That's your detrivore eating all of that decomposing matter and breaking it down and turning it back into nutrients for the soil, essentially. Mm -hmm. And yeah, to break like down legitimate toxins and mm -hmm. making them inert, basically. Like, by the time they crap them out, it's inert, essentially. Yeah. And these here, uh, they, they're in middle stages in St. Andrews, but again, remember that tiny little cute little red one? They're going to end yeah. up with um, wings all the way up. But, but you can see, but all during the year, you will find all life stages. But if you look down in, in the little corner down here, you see that little tiny little buddy nymph. All life stages at any on any given day and time of these. Except what I would want to point out, these also love to eat manchineal seeds, but these aren't manchineal that they're on right now. These are other these are little seedlings coming out of the ground. Yeah. Um I took that picture in March. That was the first recurrence of these bugs since 1917. Sorry, 2017. When the hurricanes when the hurricanes hit, it's like they disappeared. And I was I was looking for them. I asked people around, "Have you seen them anywhere? This place or the other around there?" Couldn't find them. And then suddenly, um, late last year, they appeared again. And so every month I went back, and this one was taken in March time. They are still there, so I, I don't know where they went. If they went underground, if they went into a hibernation, but it was just suddenly one day they were none, and the next day, boom, they were populating the entire region at the same amount as they were just before the hurricane. That's wild. It was like, must have gone that underground. was freaky. Underground, because animals do, do, do have their preparations for hurricanes and storms, even if we don't. And the other cute thing about them, they have a relative that lives in Florida who are yeah. always hooked up tail to back. These guys, when they get to the adults, as you see here, we'll we don't normally show. Yeah, we don't normally show pornography on this channel, but I'll accept it. I'll well, you see, they're not looking at <laughs> they're not looking at each other, so it's okay. <laughs> We're facing away. <sighs> but no, head head the interesting thing, right? Well, the rest of their life is already they're hooked for life now. Oh, they stay they stay hooked That's up it? for life. That's it. And the, how does and how does what? You ever Where's heard the of oval positive? Look at that. No, um, I just look right. Okay. Um, let me see if I can bring this up without it. That's confusing. To me. Okay, you see what you see where the hand is? Right? Yeah, there. yeah. They they are they're they're fused. So they'll just drop eggs. They'll right just there. they'll wow. just stay like that. The rest on and they'll just walk around like that, but one pulling or pushing the other. Push me pull me style. And then um I'm going to have to figure out how to wash them long enough to see exactly what they do when it's time to lay. Maybe they break apart and then that's it. Let's figure that out. Or there's another ovipositor somewhere else. Like that's not where the eggs come out. That's, we'll figure uh, it out. I'll, I'll, and the thing of it is, these things are very, very fragile. They're about the size of a fingernail. Okay. Um, one guy said it's similar to box elder beetles in, in, in his yard. There are a lot of um, beetles that look very similar to them, including others on the island. We have one that's called a milkweed, milkweed bug. Okay. Milk. <coughs> Sorry. I need to drink my monster. Which is crazy to me that you have milkweed, but yeah. I was going to say, Justin, that these look like a reverse, like a bizarro version of a box elder bug because the colors are essentially reversed. And they got that St. Andrew's name from that cross to shield. Okay. 
That makes sense. Yeah. So no. They, yeah, they're very. They're about to say my fingernail, and they're very, very fragile. Oh, you've gone again. <laughs> they're very, very fragile. So like, if you try and pick them up, you have a high chance of crushing them. You gotta try and see if you can get them to crawl towards you. But these will be in the sand on the tree limbs. These will be in the sand on the tree limbs, etc. I saw you left for a while. It wasn't my internet. I have this one button on my mouse. I need to disable it. If I hit my button, oh, I thought on it was the internet. I, the I was going to come back and tell you that I recruited all of your um, viewers away to my channel. Perfect. They would be Perfect. bored since I haven't been on in six years. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was going to say. They'll be back. They they come for the content. <laughs> well, I mean, who knows? Um, I've been I've been places where the television screen was just snow and everybody was sitting in the lounge just staring up at it. That's terrifying. I would have to leave that room immediately. <laughs> That's a scene in a horror movie right there. Like somebody's about to like find a body or something. Mm -hmm. It looks like I an anole. Well, we, we, we've got a whole variety of them. Some of them come in from other islands on birds. Some of them will swim across the ocean. Um, it's hard to tell which ones. There's arguments about which ones are indigenous, which ones aren't. But um, I'm going to see if I have a picture of one of them spread. There was a guy who came in after um, these, this spider runs around in wood crevices. If you bring, okay. if you if you stack any lumber anywhere, you're gonna find he, he finds it and gets in between them. You see the wood shaving up at the top? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't, and, and they're very very flat. I was gonna say, there's a spider that lives in the desert that buries itself, and it looks mm -hmm. exactly like that. So that similar evolution with a different reason and tight and tinier um i don't i didn't put any sense of scale on this so i'm sorry i got that's okay. figuring that out and those are flies on a mango seed okay <clears throat> just because we all like looking at flies on mango seeds there's another one of the lizards that runs around locally and he's got three spots in a pit and next one is small and supposedly i don't know a lot about these lizards supposedly this is a female for a much much larger lizard like it's like twice the size okay the male and yeah these jumping spiders i don't know how i ended up dumping in too many of them and this guy here when he's breathing his side expands out i'm gonna have to i'm gonna get you i'm gonna now that we're hooked up together, I'm going to get you more pictures of these for your fans so they can actually see how they move and behave around in the tropics. Fantastic. Okay. But I mean, really, when you get into them, you look like you got Godzilla style scales and everything else. I love these guys. I, I love watching small lizards because they have so many cool adaptations. They look very similar, but then you get into it and they're so different. Wait, what is that? Is that a uh, sea slug on the next one? Oh, this that's a blue crab. Okay. He's, he's on the water, that's why. He's in the shallows of Mando. I was like, wait, what is that? I got you. I got you now. Yeah. It went by too fast before. Oops. Yeah, and this guy was in between. I was shaving some wood. I had gotten caught out in the rain. I was deciding I'm going to make a chicken coop out of the wood. And this guy came running out from a crack. Look at the pedipalps on that guy. Holy cow. That's another jumper, but those are some long yeah. jaws. Yeah, he's tiny because it's like this was a little crack in the wood. Well, you can see if you pick up, pick up a piece of plywood that's been painted, you can see where the grain of the wood is. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that might give you a sense of what the size is. Can you see Just that, was the, that was the edge of the board that got cut. I'll go back to the other one and see them hanging there. Yeah, see the pedipalps. The pedipalps. They, They're huge. Yes, yeah, so I think any I I think any sugar ant had better run. Oh, uh, that's gotta be what they're after because it keeps them away. I was like, what are they hunting that they need to keep it that far away from their body? That makes a lot of sense. That I've, I've, of sense. I've, I've seen them charge into a trail of trail trail of the little yellow sugar ants. Uh-huh. And just seem to be having fun in there. Just hanging. So out. I don't know if they've been eating or not. And you see, to make some, an assumption that something is hunting, I learned a lesson about that too at Mandal. Okay, I was um, one day I saw a chicken hawk dive down on a magnificent frigate bird. 
Okay. okay, I don't know if you know what a magnificent frigate bird is. They, I mean, they, they, they spend most of their life in the air. Okay. Okay, and they're also called pirate birds because they don't really hunt. They know how to hunt, but they'll rather steal food from other birds. And okay. it's a big bird. It can have a wingspan over six feet. <laughs> so um, I saw a chicken hawk dive down and knock one of them out of the sky, kill it, and just start tearing the feathers up. Wow. Okay, and it's like, okay, chicken hawks will hunt seabirds. Okay, so now I kept going back to and trying to see if something like that happened again. And I had my camera and everything else. And then next time I saw it happen, camera was able to get up there and it was a big blur. So now I went to our nature people here at our Divisional Fish and Wildlife and everything else and asked them about their, their listing of the diet of the chicken hawk. And I said that they also hunt the magnificent cricket bird. And they're saying, no, it doesn't. I said, but I saw that, and, you know, everybody laughing and going on and blah, 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 blah. So now for a couple of years, I'm like, so what did I see? If they're telling me I'm wrong, are they wrong? Am I wrong? Etc. Now at the Grand Canyon National Park, okay, I had taken some pictures of a vulture that had a tag on it. And they hadn't seen this vulture in a while. And I, since I saw the tag on it, of course, you go and you talk to the park people and say, hey, I spotted a bird with a tag. And they were glad to see that bird, they did tag on the bird. But I also mentioned to the lady, oh, yeah, and um, I observed on two occasions a chicken hawk knocking a, a magnificent frigate bird out of the sky, but everybody down there is telling me that that doesn't happen. And she happened, and this is just, you know, discussions. And she said, you know, I had something similar with one of our birds. And when we went, we climbed the mountain, and when we investigated, there was a nest. She said, check to see if the area where the chicken hawk knocked down the frigate birds, and they happened to be in the same area against a tall forest of hill over there, which overlooking the bay. And that would be on, <coughs> let's see, let's see that would have been, if you can follow my mouse, it was on yeah. this side, right across there. Okay. The hillside. And so what happened was, she said, the chicken hawk probably had a nest and the magnificent frigate birds climbing the updrafts, because they climb updrafts to get way up high in the sky, cross near the nest. And the chicken hawk thought it was a threat and knocked it out of the sky. So what actually looked like hunting behavior to me turned out to be a defensive behavior. That makes sense. Okay, and it's like, no, they wouldn't normally do that, go after something <laughs> that large and that untasty, because, I mean, most seabirds don't have the greatest taste in the world. I was going to say, yeah, you don't hear about people. Yeah. Yeah, like no one, no one is eating seagull on the, uh, you know. No, so, that's where, the so that's where observation can be dangerous, and you put it down in your thing as speculation or hypothesis, and you put it out to discussion. And what happened with DPNR or the people of Fish and Wildlife is that they had the attitude that, okay, I'm in there wasting their time, get out of here. There was no discussion. It's like, no, that doesn't happen. Okay. So, I mean, you have observations like this that don't get communicated around. And it's something as simple as that. And who knows how many people would have been doing the same thing or coming to the same conclusion and being just yelled at and said, no, that doesn't happen. Who are you? Where, where did you get your training? And of course, um, this is this is pre-porn, so we can show this image. <laughs> this foreplay? This butterfly foreplay? Um, actually, I think this is when she's deciding whether or not you're going to buy her a lobster and steak or take her to McDonald's. You see the distance, the little body language thing. It's oh, yeah. barely reaching out with the antenna. It's like, okay. And then there's a little spider there in the corner. There's always got to be a spider somewhere <laughs> watching. Perf. What's he watching them for? They're all over the freaking place on St. Thomas, but it's a good thing none of them are poisonous. Maybe that's why they're all over the place. No, um, nobody that's crazy. You have all, that, all those uh, different spiders and... None of them are harmful humans. Well, what, 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 is the, what was there to defend against? I mean, an island in the middle of the ocean, there were no mammals. Um, a few snakes were boas. Um, yeah, right. that's a, that's, yeah, butterfly on the ground, that's usually close to death. 
Well, you know that, right? Yeah. Get, yeah. And fluttering around. They've already done what they needed to do. The next generation, hopefully, is on the way. Okay, well, they still that, live very long. Like, where they have a couple weeks, something uh, like that. Yeah. And and actually, yeah. right now is the season when they're fluttering all over the place. So we got the butterflies coming out all now. Oh, I imagine it's going to be beautiful. Yeah. Um, I found this guy at the same time as I found um, – no. When did I find him? Okay, this was – he was on a boat out there. Um, somebody's okay. – okay, you can you can see some of the fiberglassing. This was yeah. somebody's boat that they left on the shoreline. So, I mean, these guys will go all the way up to the sand, to the water's edge, which probably is how they get from island to island. There are a lot of things that could survive the ocean being drifted. Yeah. And these little things – Sorry, what just happened? Okay. These little guys arrived a while back. Okay. Well, there's mealybugs, and then what are these? Those look like little leaf hoppers. Yeah. No, the pink mealybug. We had a pink mealybug, which wiped out all the hibiscuses here. Oh, okay, you'll, you'll see hibiscus is few, few and far between, but um, our university actually designed a wasp that went out and, and hunted the white, the pink mealybugs. So this same thing that you would see here, that was, um, you'd see them, these little pink fluffs just floating through the air. It was a pink mealybug. Came in from the Pacific, probably on some exotic plants like hibiscus. Sure. Which is what they were eating. And they actually tore apart the island's hibiscus population before we could get them under control. Um, hibiscuses that are here now will thrive without that without infection. Now these here were on a mango on a, a stem of a mango tree in my yard. So this was not actually a man, uh, mandal picture. I think I put it in here just because they were intriguing. They or are I just grouped, sorry, or I just grouped up. Yeah. <laughs> Either or. Either or. Okay. Now these here. This is the large milkweed bug. You can you see the difference? Between yeah. this and the St. Andrews? Yeah. yeah, it's just stockier. He looks just solid. Mm -hmm. And he's doing something out of... I don't know what he's doing out of there. That's for your insect people to tell me. Um, but that is a milkweed that they are on. And what type okay. of... Milk oh, this milkweed. Uh, wow, why can't I remember the name? Um, but it, it produces a large pod. You see all the stringy stuff that's around there? The blossoms yeah. come out and float through the air on this soft, tufty stuff that's like cotton, but more fragile. Sure. And actually, these trees were brought, these plants were brought to the islands from Africa so that they could stuff mattresses, mattresses and pillows <laughs> with the, the seeds. Yeah, since the, since the material from the seed is almost like a cotton consistency, you can twist it and get a bit of a twine, but not as strong as with cotton. So that's what that's how these trees got in the island. You were saying you were surprised about the milkweeds. I was surprised that you'd have milkweed on the island. I was surprised and kind of sad by it because I know that it can be pretty. Uh, it's it's a very hardy plant that can displace other plants. Oh. I'm going to plant it here this year, but it's mm -hmm. native here because I'm getting yeah. into native plants now. Well, we now have a lot that you can't bring in anything exotic anymore. Right, you right. You can't bring life to the island anymore, but you can bring people and dogs and cats. Oh, okay. Good, good. And I won't, I won't irritate the cat people. I've never seen the purpose of a cat. <laughs> I have two. I love dogs. They were, uh, they've been, I had, hmm? they tamed themselves. The, the, the uh, anthropologists, anthropologists found, um, cohabitating cats and humans, like, 10,000 years before dogs. So the assumption is that cats found out that, you know, we had table scraps. So they would come in and then they eventually just got to live and keep pests away. So they were mutually beneficial. So, um, yeah, cats were tamed before dogs. Well, my dog hunts rats and mice and roaches and anything else. And he keeps he keeps um, predators away, and he can herd chickens. Excellent. My cat can't do that. I mean, he could. It's, my he cat's a hood ornament. <laughs> he could. He just won't. A hood ornament. That's what made me think. Okay, how did these little things get domesticated or near domesticated? A luxury society that had nothing better to do came up with the cat. The dog was a necessity. 
That's why I believe I believe the anthropologists the cats tamed themselves. Um, my wife likes to say that dogs have owners and cats have staff. <laughs> like we work for our cats, they give nothing back. So yeah, that's um, what, that's what, that's what, that's why I say I don't see the purpose. So cat, we are their slaves. <laughs> right, right. So okay, uh, after we want to know how we're saving Man uh, Bay and how he can help. Uh, yeah, we're gonna post links in the video description, and then um, I'm gonna direct you. I can't invite you right now to the to the ISO Buddies group because I'm on a 30 day ban again. Um, but okay. <laughs> I have hard well, opinions about Canadian geese that are just not acceptable. So what's happening with Man uh, Bay is what what it what happened was it needed a lot of education and still needs education. <laughs> Because technically, there's a 99-year lease on that land. Okay. Okay. And while we have never gotten a full challenge against that lease, so that's why we stay vigilant saying, okay, have they abandoned it or will this suddenly pop back up? Because our contention is, is that that le lease was granted illegally and against the deed covenants. Okay. The land was granted to the people of the Virgin Islands. Okay. And right now, awareness, sharing. I mean, you, you don't have to bring up ton of people into a, a movement. We don't need that right now. We just need basically um, a casual awareness occasionally. I mean, you come across man, uh, maybe you see a cute picture or image, um, share, share it about. Okay, um, I put images up on, on splash.com. You have a link link for that. And those yeah. images actually you can use for your private projects, your commercial projects, any which way, except you can't hang it up as artwork and sell it as your image. And the real purpose of that is because you have environmental organizations, you have groups, you have individuals all over the world who don't have the resources of these big giant foundations to go out and hire photographers or get you content for your newsletter or like a nice little header. For so I've decided, okay, these images from Mandal um, and whatnot, I put them out there so that if you, you, a group needs it, they can use it. Um, I do have an example here and I'll get to ways that they can, that if, if they want to help more directly, I mean, I think Buddy is a person who um, deserves more help than, than us right now. We do actually have a Patreon page, which I have not been monitoring because I spend my time out in the bush, sure. but I, I can bring it back on. Um, yeah, let me show you this. Okay. For instance, right here, driving transportation performance to solve climate change. Um, I forget what all the acronym is for, but this is a nonprofit that's involved in the environment. Okay, and they had a web page, and they were talking about, and one of their articles actually had to do with certain logistical things that would reduce uh, pollution. They found my image with cars on the highway, which was free to use, and everything else, and they were able to chuck it up and do their little, and do the article um, at a lower cost than they would have normally had. It's no skin off of my back. These are all digital images that snap the my professional stuff I've never put online. Okay, sure. simply because somebody paid for them. It's not my intention to do. So the rest of this stuff that I do casually, it helps. It, it helps just for people to use these images and share them. Okay, because things always come back and link back around. Just like how you did this, your research and Toronto stuff from years back. Okay, things will have links or credits on them. Somebody will find them 10 years from now. You never know what impact it will have. It's just like a teacher. A teacher never knows what impact it will have on, on the lives of the people that they're teaching. Somebody taught Glenn Armstrong and he ended up on the moon. The teacher didn't know that. Yeah. Okay, so that's one of the purposes for sharing these things. Um, the biggest thing that we have going on at Mandal Bay right now is an organization called Camp Umoja. Okay, and we actually have a, what's called a SEER program. And Camp Umoja is where um, as much wildlife as there is on St. Thomas, the tourist knows more about what's on St. Thomas than the natives do. They're, good to, yeah. they're busy doing their eight to five jobs every day and then are coming home to take care of their kids and going through all the regular life stresses. They're just living. Uh, Right. Yeah. And so the tourists now are coming here, they're doing the adventure stuff, jumping in the ocean, going to the beach, going on the nature tours and all this type of stuff and snapping away and seeing all this gorgeous, exotic life to them. And most of it 
the residents have never ever seen, even though it might just be in their backyard. But you're not paying attention because you got all the other life things. So one of the biggest things to try and stop mass development and get and and turn into planned development because we're not against development. People gotta live. People gotta eat. Economy yeah. gotta run. It's how it is planned. Um, <clears throat> was to the best way was to get this stuff out among people and learning and getting people out to the campground. So if you were coming here and you wanted to do a kayak tour for a half day or something like that, that'd be like 65 to $100. Okay? okay. What we've been doing is we've been doing it for $10. <clears throat> um, for, the, for, um, for the school kids, for um, low-income families and people, etc. And what actually turned out from doing that is that remember I was telling you about the we, the underwater robots that we that we had the kids doing about ten yeah. uh, ten years ago on up and the one kid who got invited over to Puerto Rico, okay he was a troublemaker in school and he was failing. Okay, he got out into the wild. He got his hands on that machine on on the machine. It was broken on in the parts and he just naturally figured out how to get this thing together. And so he went from a failing troublemaker to somebody who was invited to speak at a science convention within a year because we because we had our program and this year program we decided to do scholarship okay so after the hurricane we said families are hurting and everything else we we're just gonna what we have left in the bank if staff wants to volunteer we can volunteer if they want stipend we use what's left in the bank to stipend them and we've been running the program since then as a scholarship and we are looking to going back to having have the kids pay them. But before it was like, you get your kayak, we do your kayak day and everything else for 10 bucks. If you want to join the environmental rangers, uh, five dollar dues every Saturday. If you don't have it, well, forget about that. Okay, but because our main mission was knowledge, awareness is what will make the change. And so when we talk about what can they do, we are more in the educational mode. If they want to donate something, it, it, it will go toward exactly that education and we can show them exactly what's doing. But it's your show. <laughs> so I want to go to yeah. say donate to me or anything else like that. The most important thing they can do is awareness. Talk about it. The links that I'll be sent that I sent you, I'll be updating photographs or whatnot. And they'll have they'll have attributions and captions. So if you people want to say, hey, here's a cool bug or lizard that was in St. Thomas and share it wrong. It increases the world awareness. That's basically what has to happen right now. And we can get to a point where people are coming up will see these things. It'll be natural to them. And if it's gone, they will miss it. I mean, yeah, it sounds like the whole island will miss it. And then Okay. Yeah, not, not just the island. What I'll, what we support, we support life going all the way into the Arctic, <laughs> into the Arctic Circle. That's been shown. Okay, basically the, the um, the whales that come through there, other marine mammals, the large the large fish that follow them. I mean, we got um, we have the world record for marlin and swordfish right now, and all that type of stuff. You can see it hanging. We got the stuffed replica hanging at our airport as you arrive on the island. Okay, and and stuff like that. So we get so what the creatures that arrive here and to the Caribbean chain and take advantage of the coral reef come from the entirety of the Atlantic Ocean. Okay, so. The destruction of these habitats, the destruction of these reefs. Each time one goes, that's a, that's a habitat loss. And when that habitat, we all know what happens when you have habitat loss. The creatures that are in that habitat, they can't all move to a new habitat. They're occupied. Most will yeah. die. Okay, and that's what we that that's what we're seeing occur. Okay, so. The warming, the warming is not is not one hundred percent man made. Um, Noah, Noah scientists will tell you that the ocean has been warming for some time. We we're doing certain there's a certain amount of acceleration by man made activity, but it can't tell us how much. Yeah, which means that we gotta look at. The only way to find out how much is to start pulling back on certain things and measuring what happens. Okay, what is also happening at Mandal now in, in getting the awareness out there, like Yale University comes in a couple times a year now with students for education and teaching. The University of the Virgin Islands is now using us for the mangrove program. Um, 
the SROV program has expanded out into the ocean glider program that we actually do, and those are the um, engineless, um, the engineless submarines, the AI engineless submarines that have been going across the Atlantic for um, about 14, 15 years now. My son helped with the development of those, so we, we can go into those at a later date. It's called the ocean glider. They operate for years at a time, and we don't have to do anything with them. And it's now been spread out so that they're now doing <clears throat> whale and cetacean research down at, um, in South America. Of course, the Navy has their hands on some of them. But sure, the most, sure. <clears throat> the greatest thing about this technology is that we do, are not spending oil and gas in boats taking these submarines out to their operating location. They don't use any fuel. They can be programmed in advance to say, this is what we want you to do. And we just drop them in the water and they go. They come back to the surface and they talk to the satellites, um, give us the information, they head back down. Okay, so we're getting more information on birds from this. Um, observations, insects at sea, well, ocean temperatures, stuff like that, of course. Um, but preserving areas like Mandahal Bay, it's where we did a lot of the testing for some of these submarines with the kids. Okay, that have grown right. into practical real-world Give me, real uh, world give me just a second today. here. I want to address. Just. Yeah. Um, I want to address this, or the both of us address it. Um, I'll do my thoughts before I hand it over. Because um, I know you have more educated thoughts, but let's see what we come up with on this. And then we'll probably wrap it up. It's getting pretty late for my okay. audience. Oh, so, I'm sorry about that. I can't even no, see that's how okay. many people are on. I'm on I can talk till 3 a.m. So there's only seven people on right now, but I okay. think I could talk to you till 3 a.m. Well, I can talk till the next millennium. Yeah, what, right? What, what, so, <laughs> the pessimistic side. No, no, it's never too late. Hello. The, the only way to come out of pessimism is to be aware of optimistic items. Um, like it's not that. too late for awareness also because, okay, let's think about Let's think about school. People are being born every day. There actually was somebody born yesterday who doesn't know this. Okay? Literally, yep. kindergarten, we're teaching kids the alphabet. Now, the thing that has happened with the internet is everybody of every age group is on the internet. So we have to provide resources for all age groups. So we cannot assume that people are aware. Well, you, and you might have somebody... you. You might have somebody who was out in the wild for 10 years or who never had internet or who's never been exposed to these things. So you always have to give people that background. You can't assume that people know. But awareness must always be done. Otherwise, people also forget. Okay, and really I think what you're saying is that the world is on a downward spiral. It's, I think it's what's meant there. And I don't, I don't have yeah. that view. And I've seen a lot of crap. I've seen a lot of pollution. I've seen a lot of ugly things done by, by human beings, but I've also, if I want to be alone and out there and someplace where no human has ever been, I can still get there and I can still see a lot of wildlife. And those are the recovery points. Those are the recovery areas. The people who are learning in their home how to keep these various species alive, some of them that are so difficult, some tropical species I can't keep alive in the tropics. Okay. That, yeah, is, yeah. that is a future and awareness that you at home can simply find a hobby that you would like that involves nature, record it, communicate it with other people, is a form, is citizen scientists, is citizen science. That's how science started. A couple of people sit there and wrong and say, hey, well, what, well, what about that? And that guy say, hey, hmm, you know something? I can do this with that. Bam. But we got our firstborn arrow through to shoot and to hunt that way, even though a lot of people don't like hunting. But I mean, when there's uh, a trout, if there's a trout, you're going to hunt. We didn't have refrigerators to store up um, vegetables all the time. I think most of us here are okay. Yeah, but I mean. Not like hunting pandas. Not like hunting pandas, but it's another species I don't care about at all. I hate that the panda is like the, the logo for conservation because a panda is on the bridge of extinction every day all by itself. Like it doesn't need any help. Like it was, it's an evolutionary well, dead end. Well, yeah, and, just... that's, and that is a problem too. We're spending a lot of money on species that should go extinct. Yeah, that or would. would. Be a, that, and the species that would be extinct if not for human intervention. 
Absolutely. And I, and I, I wonder about that too, because one thing with your with what, what you're looking at here, what you're seeing with the depth of life in the Mandal ecosystem. Okay. And we talk about, okay, life is interlinked and everything else. And if you lose this part of the food chain, things start to collapse and all that type of stuff. Okay. But nature is so wonderfully redundant that things step in. I think where the pessimists are, if we're saying, hey, we're running out of that redundancy. Okay. But if you have seen how life adapts after a big storm, how it springs back, how, look at this lizard here and you see how its legs are up and that stands yeah. back. Okay. Yeah. That is not because he's doing his little mating thing. Okay. They actually do stand with that splayed brace. And it is something that you will see in lizards in the West Indies, the Caribbean region, etc., that you don't see in most lizards on the mainland. And even lizards of the same species, okay, that have the slight adaptation. What happened, what this scientist figured out, and he ran experiments afterwards, because he hopped from island to island after hurricanes Irma and Maria throughout the Caribbean. And okay. it, it just occurred to him that, wait a minute, these lizards all survive, but look, this breeze blowing, and he's facing right into the breeze and nothing's happening. And it's something that we've observed for a while. One of these can land on the windshield of your car while you're driving, and he'll stay there through your whole trip. Not move, no matter how fast your car goes. He is actually has developed a natural stance to brace against tropical storm force winds. That's crazy. It's the aerodynamic okay. lizard. Yeah. So tropical storms are a regular thing. Okay. Um, you know, you know, getting up to about 40. 50 miles per hour. You're like a tropical storm. You get into a hurricane, I think, at around 70 miles per hour. Yeah. 70, 74. So tropical storms are a regular thing here. And these these critters, these animals have developed a stance. And you, you see that among all of our lizards. Except the iguanas. I think the iguanas just hug the ground. They just blow away. They just fall okay. out of trees. They're awful. So the thing is, is that... Um, a teacher is a special person because a teacher can come into a classroom for 30 years and say the same thing. Okay. And so where we have some people starting to say, oh, I'm tired of this. There's no change. Nothing is happening and everything else. Remember that change happens slowly and over time. It took us like 150, 170 years of industrialization to get to this point. If we stopped everything overnight, you know what a ripple effect is. <laughs> it will continue. Yeah. It will continue until it gets to a crest, and then slowly start correcting itself. Okay, so we have to adapt. We have to. I'm uh, watching how creatures adapt. Watching how these natural ecosystems shift and adjust to climate change will give us as humans our clues as to what to do next to protect our living spaces and areas. So. I mean, okay, we're going to be co we're correlating a lot that's getting into drift off territory at this time of night. Um, but essentially, um, we'll talk some more. And actually, now that I know more of what your audience is and everything else, I think I can target yeah. my stuff more to what their interests may be or um, sure. whatnot. But to expand outward and protect areas, do what you're doing. Talk about it. Raise awareness. Do it without getting frustrated. Because the day you get frustrated... It's one more step toward giving up. And if enough people give up, yeah, the pessimism would be real. Yeah, yeah. Get out there okay. and find something worth protecting, too. And like get out there and area. find people. We don't need to find the giant foundations and whatnot all the time. Look at some of the people around you in your area. Look at the people that we've been able to interact with since COVID online. Yeah. And realize that there are enormous resources there that have not been tapped. And let's figure out a way to tap them so that people don't get bored. <laughs> because it's a heady subject. It is a very, very heavy and heady subject. There is no such thing truly as a climate scientist. It's a combination of a whole, it's a combination of hundreds of sciences. The people who call themselves and say there's, there's people who give out degrees for that for climate science right now. And I think that basically they are the philosophers of the climate era. Yeah. Who have had some educa enough education to come out and talk to people. Okay, but I think a lot of the talking is like what the person said. Okay, how, what can we do to help? Okay, right. what you can do to help is 
Um, keep people going. Keep the regular citizen, regular person who is involved in this going. Check your sources, of course. You can't just spread out your donations of money left, right, and send it to everybody. I guess that's where the big foundations have the advantage is that you know they're verified. Even though that you still don't know what's happening to your money. That's true. Okay. If you give it to ISO buddies, I'm very transparent. I'll tell you exactly what I'm doing with that money. So. <laughs> Might not be what you would do with it, but I'll tell you what I'm doing with it. <clears throat> No, but but the whole thing is is that you've got to, you're going to be experimenting. You're going to be playing around. You're going to have failures and get back and have to be able to get back up. People support the support of people, the support of an audience, the support of other like-minded thinking individuals. It's what's going to get each of us back up when we fall down. Coming toward the end of this man now, baby, went. I literally went nine days without sleep. Wow. Okay. It was months before I got myself back in the shape where I could even leave the house. Okay, I was that was a total. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> okay, don't stay up all those nights. But anyways, I'm gonna let you go. Um, give your fans those links. Okay. I'm gonna put all of them in the thing right after we're done here. And so. then I'll start. And I'll start sending the. Uh, they'll start getting more active stuff out of Mandalby and whatnot. And then they could decide themselves as to how they wish to help, if they want to do that. Yeah, or just well, help, like uh, like you say, you don't necessarily have to put your energy and time into Mandal Bay specifically, but into something <laughs> closer or something else that you're interested in. So every sure. yeah, exactly. It's global. Every little bit helps. So, yeah, yeah, and and hello, we will get through this this climate change thing. We will. Some okay, so the pe the pessimist, some of us. <laughs> when I say we, I mean as a species, we will. And a lot of the life that is threatened, we're going to find ways to save them because the kids coming out of school today. Remember, youth is where these I the ideas are most spinning, most generating. That's when you have your most creativity. So that's where we focus on. Bring yeah. the youth up. Bring them up thinking in a different way than what we thought. Okay, yeah. bring them up in a full awareness of what's going on around the entire world. We didn't have that growing up. The internet has brought that. Okay? That's true. That's true. So, so um, you Thank you look you. like you're a little tired yourself. I would, I've been drinking caffeine. <laughs> I know, right? I have some kind of like strep throat or something coming out. But of course, so right now, just... yeah. And for me right now, I'm an hour ahead of you. So it's 11.47 p.m. I got to go oh, wow. my dog. Okay. Yeah, so you're ahead of us. So, hey, yeah. Carl, thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for your support of the show. Um, thank you for sharing all this information with us. I feel like we just barely tapped the iceberg. So um, expect to be recruited and coming back on again. All right. At least okay, and thank you. And now that I know what's going on, I can share your link out to my people so I can get them in on your audience for the next one. Oh, thank you very much. So yeah, we try to be nice here. We try to respect our, our guests okay. as much as Hold possible. On. Oh, you're leaving. Hold on one second. There's something happening oh. right there. Okay. I love that that's his scuba gear behind him. He's in his scuba shed, you guys. So I've I have yet to be as fascinated with a guest as I am with Carl. Um, and yeah, Aftec pandas suck. Pandas are just a garbage species. They evolved to die. Like pandas, this is a fact. Pandas are 100% always on the edge of starvation because bamboo has such little nutritional value. So they get a full stomach from it and it's readily available. Um, but yeah, they're if that's how you evolved, like... Uh, koalas too. Koalas are super cute, but um, ah. eucalyptus is not great. I'm sorry. That's okay. Are you I'm okay? Back wet hands. Yeah, no. It was the air pump for the. I was filling tanks for tomorrow's dive. Okay. Okay. And then the pump was started giving its alarm and everything else, and it's like I had to rush out. What's the mission sorry. for the dive tomorrow? What are we? What are we looking for? Um, I'm just going down to see what's there. Hopefully, find some octopus. Very cool. Do you get to have okay. cool interactions? This is just a side note. Do you get to have some cool interactions with octopus? Um, they're actually. I, I I will send you a video. You can um, okay. they will stay there and they will change color. They'll do their things in the rock stairs when the where the females come and curl up with their eggs until they hatch. 
<clears throat> and that's the um, common octopus and the Caribbean octopus. The Caribbean one, the Caribbean, you see in the day, the other one is a nighttime octopus. So I'm going after the day yeah. ones tomorrow. And also I take my spare gun, not, not, I'm not going fishing. That's for lionfish. The reason Good. we get rid of any lionfish we see is that those guys will wipe out all life in an area in no time if you let them get a foothold. I hate that because they are so beautiful. And it, it kills me that they're so invasive and so mm -hmm. just they get well, tucked in and yeah. it's like the worst thing ever. We're going to get dragged off, but um, we're going to get dragged off of your clothing. <laughs> yeah, I know. We already are. But, so. Yeah, but we we actually have trained some local species to start eating the lionfish. Fish. Oh, that's awesome. Eels, Eels and stuff like that. Yeah, don't. Um, I'll explain to you later how we did that during the dive, but now they are now recognizing them as something that they can eat. Well, let's do that. Let's do that later. So uh, thank you so much, Carl. I truly, this has been a pleasure. So uh, uh, really appreciate you taking the time. So, uh, uh, but thank you again. Absolutely. I hope this helps a little bit to get it out there to my like 15 viewers. So, <laughs> uh, well, heck, that's how these things all, that's how these things always start. Okay. Little. It, 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 small. Yeah. Yeah. Start small and, and, and snowballs up. Either it snowballs up or it doesn't. What do you say? Run it off a flagpole and see who salutes it? Yeah, I think. But yeah, so it, 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 it is a constant thing. And we are constantly down there, constantly doing things, constantly doing cleanups, constantly tracking wildlife, constantly educating people. And one of the reasons it has to be done is that um, possession being nine-tenths of the law, if we stop for a long enough period of time, the, uh, the relic can come back in and claim, oh, see, abandoned, it's not being used, it's a, uh, blah, 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 blah. And that the intent for the pro the intent of the purpose and being given to the public is not being properly exploited, and thus we should be able to have it. And there are ways to make that legal argument in court. So sure, we maintain the use. And by the way, no, I don't get a salary out of it. I'm director of climate change at <laughs> work, and Camp Moja is the camp wrong. Where all, yeah. all of our staff is volunteers, what we do is we stipend and hire actual certified teachers. Okay. Okay. To come in and do the education alongside our um, environmental exposure, so the kids Excellent. aren't getting anything that we guess. They're getting a they're getting an actual curriculum because we do recruit the certified teachers. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. And that and that's actually where our money goes. Everything else comes out of our pockets. All right. Well, keep it up. And right, we'll great. be touching base a lot. Okay. Thanks so much, Carl. All right. Great. And you have a, have a great night. Have a good dive tomorrow. Okay. Thanks. Right, and bye. Salutations to all of your followers. Excellent. Thank you so much. We'll get plenty of views tomorrow. So, okay. Great. We'll talk to you later, Carl. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. I, yeah, I, I could have seriously talked to Carl another four hours. So, um, guys, thanks for coming on. I don't even know how to close this one. So this could start a whole series of videos here, right here, honest to God. Um, I, I got to say, I love that our pessimist also has the act of kindness comment to make. That gives me hope. Uh, have a great night, you guys. If you haven't already, click like, click subscribe, go over to Patreon, throw us some money. You don't have to do that. Um, it, it's half a joke. So have a great night, okay? So find out what you can do in your neighborhood. Find out what you can do in your area. Um, find somebody to support. But I'll be here. I'll talk to you guys later, okay? Next week, we're taking the week off uh, for Halloween. So the week after, we have somebody. Again, it's a surprise. We'll talk to you later.